But that's but that's the thing. The best I can get is, yes, you have used, you're using these are hieratic. I mean, that's kind of funny. I had some some people that weren't believing, were arguing. Well, that's not that hieratic. It should be another form. Maybe it's this cliff form. I'm like, okay, now we're talking about it is hieratic, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So so you guys are admitting that there is Egyptian here. And so the, the debate is not whether there is an Egyptian in the character's document, it's what form maybe you're looking at. So mm. Mormonism with the Murph. We're already seeing explorers church history and the church's street claims. Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel, Mormonism with the Murph. We're already seeing explorers the church's history and the church's street claims. Uh, in today's episode, I have back with me uh geologist and scholar Jerry Grover. Jerry, welcome back. Yeah, good to be back. Yep, good to have you on. And today in the interview, we're going to be looking at the characters document. Uh, Jerry is someone who's done a lot of research into the characters document, uh, has even attempted a translation of the characters document. Uh, and the characters document is something that's been, I think, a point of controversy among different scholars. Some people believe in its deformed English, other people thinking that it may be looks similar to like Egyptian hieratic or demonic, but you're the first person that I'm aware of who has attempted a translation of it. And I only learned about that, I think in the past year or so of me doing my channel was whenever I did an episode on uh, reformed Egyptian and uh, looking at the characters document was whenever I first looked into this. So I thought that was really cool. Um, and a lot of your work comes from this book, translation of the characters document which I have sort of scarred through, but I think I would need to study it very intensely to understand and take everything in. But in today's presentation, you're going to kind of go through how you went about trying to do the translation of um, of the character's document and sort of your, your methodology and approach. I also want to give a little bit of a disclaimer that I'm not um, endorsing or validating or uh, authenticating your translation. Of course, I'm not a scholar. I'm not a linguistic expert, uh, but neither am I sort of rejecting or dismissive. I think it's really interesting and fascinating. And I think more scholars should look into the work you've done. So hopefully this will be an interesting episode. Okay. You should probably tell your listeners they need to take two aspirin right now before they get into this. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if you read the book, it'd give you a headache, but it is it gets into a lot of the details and weeds of ling you know language and linguistics so it's not you know it's not one you're going to have some you know spiritual experience i don't think but it's, yeah it may it's not be the most exciting topic but i think it's kind of i think this is interesting as well and i think this is an area of i think academia and uh like scholarship with regards to the book of mormon that doesn't get much attention from it yeah did you feel like that uh, as well like before you sort of dived into the characters document like there's been some comments from different maybe uh lds or non-lds maybe egyptologists commenting on it, but there's not been a whole lot of scholarship on it that i'm aware of yeah honestly i only i was doing another book on the gold the metallurgy of the gold plates and so i was going to look at the character density and could the book of mormon fit on the plates so i thought oh, i'll just look at the characters document right people call it the anthon anton transcript and um I noticed, oh my gosh, there, because I actually, you know, I worked as a translator for a long time, both Italian and then different languages, kind of like I, before you have like Google Translate, I mean, I would do the kind of core translation and then give it to a native speaker to finish it off. So, um, but um, yeah, I was looking, I was like, well, oh, that's a Mesoamerican number nine right there. And there right next to it is, uh, we're pretty, pretty close is, uh, Egyptian five and 10, pretty standard erratic, even a four. I mean, it was like, oh, we've got, there's clearly some numbers here. And so that just piqued my interest. And then I started just working on trying to figure out, you know, all the glyphs. And I figured out pretty quickly just because of the numbers. We're talking hieratic. There, there's basically three major forms of Egyptian. There's the monumental form, which is what you see on the temples and, you know, has the actual figures of insects and animals, the birds, all those kinds of things, right? And then there's a shorthand. They've Hieratic is the shorthand version, and it's existed about the same time as the hieroglyphs, so it's been concurrent. And then there's another shorthand form developed about 650 
BC called demotic and some yeah. hieratic and demotic is similar. The glyphs look the same, but others aren't. And it's more of a cursive type type script, meaning it. Um, so anyway, so that was, kind of, I started just working on it to say, okay, I've got these numbers. See if I can figure out what all the numbers are. And then there were things around, you know, and then I started, okay, now I'll start working on, well, one thing that was interesting, we'll talk about it. Today, we're going to talk about the numbers and then the calendar markers. It's surrounding the number sets. There were some glyphs that were occurring with the number sets, but they weren't numbers. And I, I kept looking at them and says, I know I've seen these somewhere. Where where have I seen these? You know. And then I recognized they were the, the Maya calendar indicator glyphs, that they're in the, they're infix glyphs in the calendar glyphs of the Maya. So anyway, so that was kind of a major breakthrough that they're actually using kind of the system that's used in Mesoamerica um, for calendrical. Um, I'm thinking that, and you're going to go through this, but you kind of start, start with the numbers and then the dates is sort of like the first part of the, the translation. Yeah. I mean, I figured out some other things, right? There's like, okay. I figured out 24 and there's a rebus for plates and then there's gold, you know, I, I look in front of it. Okay. There's a hieratic for gold. So, I mean, I'm just saying that I didn't, I didn't only, I, I looked at also the text to around it. Right. But, but it was kind of the first, <clears throat> first effort was looking and it was iterative meaning, um, okay, I've got a number, a date, what's happening around that in the book of Mormon. Cause I use the book of Mormon as a template actually, once I'd figured out the dates, um, it's like, okay, what's going on? So, and then once I figured out what they were, like the first part, it looks like it's the preface to the book of Mosiah that made it easier to then say, okay, I can look, I can just look for this, these particular words. Cause I'm expecting them. Right. It's not that I wouldn't have found them. It just made it easier and faster. And okay. then, does that make sense? So, yeah. Uh, and in today's presentation, you're saying that you won't be presenting all of sort of the work and the translation, this might be like a part one. So maybe there'll be another part where you might come back and present sort yeah. of more of the research of how you went about sort of translating the entire document. I think so. Yeah, I think just because it's, it's so much information, right? And so I, and I, want people, right. I want to be able to ask questions and that kind of thing. Right. So you want to be quite thorough uh, in this part going through sort of like your approach. I think a good place to start could be because you mentioned that the character's document isn't the same as the Anton transcript. Could you maybe explain what is the character's document, sort of where it came from? Yeah, it basically um, came from David Whitmer, had it, and then was given to the RLDS Church, which is now the Community Church of Christ. The LDS Church historic, uh, History Department looked at it um, for handwriting, and it looks like it's John Whitmer. Some people say no, but I mean, that right now, that's the best... And so if it was penned by John Whitmer, then you've got a pretty good provenance all the way back. Um, uh, is this likely a direct copy from the gold plates or a copy of a copy or do we know? Um, well, we have, and I'll get into that in the, we have another, another version of it that was in a broadside that was a little later. Um, I think they proposed, there was an article done that they proposed that it was probably not the first generation. It was a second generation because we don't really have any indication that John Whitmer had access to the plates to copy off the plates. I mean, I suppose it's possible, but they think right. they tend to think it's Joseph Smith's copying and then, um, you know, somebody copying from him. And this was the reason is that there's an early picture. I didn't have it in the, in the, in the presentations in the book of 1887 showing the character's document. It's actually part of another page. It was folded over, and so it looks like they maybe carried these out for like missionary thing. Like, Hey, here's the gold, here's the characters of the gold plates. I mean, that's what the broadside was doing was advertising the book of Mormon. So, right. Uh, yeah. So it's, it probably was not first generation copy. Right. Right. And, and uh, so, I think I remember reading in your book somewhere, and I don't know if this is on one of your slides, but if it is, you know, a, a copy of a copy, then one of the limitations of this could be is how accurate, you know, there might be some errors from the scribe at how accurate these reflect the characters that were on the plates. 
Yeah, and that's something to consider that, you know, especially when you get into something that's a little more vague or something, they don't have a lot of details. Right. But I, I was able to figure out most of them pretty straightforward, actually, in hieratic and demotic. Um, the other okay. thing, oh. the other thing, the Anton transcript talks about, it has an emblem on it, has columns of text. Like and, a Mexican zodiac? A yeah, Mexican <laughs> zodiac. And then it mentioned there were stars and moons and other natural objects. That's doesn't. That's not what the character's document looks like. Yeah, so, new things aren't so, on there, so it's clear that's not what's brought to Charles Anton. Right, exactly. So that's why we people call it that for many years, not really looking at it critically. Right. But honestly, the document is really not. Unfortunately, like you said, or anybody did anything on it. You know, I was kind of shocked. There was a guy named Ariel Crowley, which we'll talk about. He did a some things in the improvement era, which. Neil showed, but there was actually another book in 1961 where he actually went into more detail. Um, looking at them kind of from Egyptian, but other than that, very little. Right. Uh, so it's kind of, I, I thought, well, you know, I'll just give it a shot and I actually worked on it. I was like, well, actually, this makes sense. So, well, awesome. Well, so I think what we'll do is um, you have a presentation and slides prepared. We'll go through it. I'll try not to add too much commentary, but I'll maybe interject if I have a question here or there um, and any clarification. And then at the end, if there's time, I might have a few questions I want to ask, but I want, want to save them more towards the end so you can go through yeah. your presentation. Okay, great. Awesome. Uh, let's see. Are you able sure, to sure. share your screen? Let's see. I think I've enabled you. There you go. Right. Sure. Uh, I'll I'll put a link as where where people can read this book. I believe they can get a free copy online. Yeah, yeah you can download. And my I have a website. I have I have it at the end where anybody can download any of my books. I don't. I mean, I have some hard copies that I sell, but not for money. I mean, not for profit. I just have them available. So. Um. That's just kind of the way I do research. But. Yeah. So this is kind of the book. Um, we'll get into the little color coding I've done here that is indicative of the numbers and the markers. So, Alrighty. So that's it. that's your character's document. As you can see, kind of they didn't have, doesn't, it's spelled. <laughs> People say, how come you keep spelling it wrong? <laughs> it's like, well, it's because yeah. that's the way it's spelled on the document. <laughs> So um, it's funny. I, I've noticed whenever I've tried spelling with the word, you know, character, um, I, I've at times misspelled it because of the, the character's document. <laughs> pops up. Yeah. But it's actually helpful because then if you want to find it on the internet, you Google this and you find it because it's got not a common spelling. But so as you can see, there's lines of uh, text here, glyphs. I've pointed uh, set by seven lines. Yeah, the upper ones are a little larger and looks like they have a cutoff here, meaning maybe that's the end and they've started something else. Yeah, they um, get a bit smaller, the bottom three yeah. lines. Right, so that's some indication maybe there is something different there, that they copied a section and copied something else. Um, then we'll talk about it. The other question, you know, Joseph Smith indicated that it read right to left. Um, yes. It, and, of course... People say, oh, we studied Hebrew, but well, okay. Um, the translation will tell me if that's correct or not. <laughs> Meaning, well, I believe at this point, I don't believe he would have studied uh, Hebrew because that was um, when Joshua Asatius came, wasn't it? Right. And I don't know what the date, but I'm kind of like, I didn't care about that because I'm like, all right. <laughs> I believe that was in it, Kirtland. It, it, yeah. If it's not right to left, I'll be able to figure it out pretty quickly trying to translate it, right? <laughs> right. And then the other thing you have to ask is, okay, does it go? Right to left. I mean, when they copied off the characters, where it was the edge of the text, the edge of the plate. So then it started again on the next line, or how were they copying it? Meaning you could, you know. So I had to try to make sure I looked at that, but it looks like they actually copied. This is actually how it appeared on the plates. Right. Yeah. So I, I figured that out. So, so anyway, that's the character's document. And you'll notice over here on the side, it's kind of, you've got some washed out kind of area and there's earlier pictures. If you look at my book that actually had, there was more paper here, got flaked off. They had a picture from 1887. So I do use the other example we have because it actually has some additional glyphs, but let's go to 
Right. And I, I assume that this was copied down whenever Joseph was translating the Book of Mormon at the Whitmer's home, um, June 1829, or do, do we know the date um, it was copied? It's not known. Not really. Not really. No. Okay. So, I mean, that's a good assumption, but we don't have any. There's no other really information about the date other than we know, you know, because John Whitmer was not in the church right after a period of time. So we, we, we know that he wouldn't have copied it after he left the church. Right. <laughs> probably. So, so it was probably in the time frame. you know, it could have been, like I said, he may have copied it directly off the plates. I don't know that that's. Um, oh, I know. I know he did participate as one of the scribes whenever right. they yeah, were at the, the, the Whitmer home. And, but... he, and he saw the plates too. So, I mean, you know, so. Okay. Goodness. Anyway, this is a translation. We don't have to go through it right now, but um, essentially I, I translated the, the first four lines, um, which, like I said, looks to be like the preface to the book of Mosiah, which is missing. It's part of the 116 pages. Mm -hmm. And this is the what I call the prophetic calendar. Um, it's the last lines. And I don't, I presume this is probably um, a pre part of the preface to the book of Mormon itself. Every, every other part of the Book of Mormon has a preface to it, but we don't have the Book of Mormon itself having a preface. So again, 116 pages issue. It's also possible maybe it was put on, it was on the uh, small plates because basically, you know, it said to Joseph Smith to translate what was on the small plates up to the point of King Benjamin or something. So there may have been additional information on the small plates that didn't get translated because it wasn't part of the, what was missing, you know what I'm saying? It was maybe just extra. So th that's just a, Oh, okay. Just, just possibilities, you know. So, okay. So, this is kind of, you know, the statements where it's, in 1827, Joe Smith commenced copying the characters off the plates. We know he copied them off the plates. Right. Um, I, I copied a considerable number of them by means of the Urim and Thummim. I mean, that's the interpreters at this point. Mm -hmm. I translated some of them. Now, actually, I in my book, I, there were four that we have a scrap of paper from Oliver Cowdery and also Freddie G. Williams copied them of four glyphs that are translated book of Mormon and interpreters of languages. And I deal with those in my book too, saying, okay, I think I can translate those and see if the translation is correct. And it is. So, um, and the one thing we know, it's also, it also tells us something. Um, if he knew they went read from right to left, that means that the way he was using the interpreters was he actually, yeah, you actually had to be able to identify a character, right, and translate, or he wouldn't know which character is being translated. So either they appeared together in the, you know, or, pro you know, I'm theorizing that probably maybe one of the, the stones you actually would put on, because it says magnify, you know, magnify the words. So maybe you put one over the glyph, and then the other one indicated the meaning of it, right? Because mm -hmm. he was translating individual glyphs, individual characters, we know that. Um, early on of course later it talks about him just you know having the plates aside and it was just kind of showing up i mean there's different theories but i'm kind of more right scout, so scout this is in the beginning what joseph says about how he attempted to translate some of the characters yeah and that's why a lot of people say oh it shows you know it's misrepresenting so joseph smith with the plates translating that's somebody misrepresenting it's like well no that's what he did initially and you know the stone and the hat all that well of course um he may have it talks about them, him putting a couple uh, references, say he put the interpreters in the hat themselves, both. Yeah, I, I'm actually doing an upcoming episode on the translation of the Book of Mormon because I've been trying to get my my head around it because my initial view, and we don't have to talk about this because this takes away from your yeah. presentation, but my initial view was that it was the Urim and were the spectacles during the 116 pages, and then after the loss of the 116 pages, then it was just the seer stone. And there are some accounts that support that, but I've been I've been trying to get my hand on pretty much every account of how the Book of Mormon was translated, and there's lots of conflicting statements, shall we say? Yeah, yeah, Some people say after the last 116 pages it was just the seer stone, but then you have other people like Oliver Joseph, John Whitmer, who still talk about the spectacles after the last 116 pages. So it's actually not easy to pinpoint when exactly was the Urim and Thummim or the spectacles being used and when was the seer stone um but yeah, i mean it's, i think it's even possible i think the evidence would indicate he could remove a stone one stone if he wanted because martin harris said he oh i took the stone got something out of the stream 
because he was there, you know, during the 116 pages. I'm like, yeah, well, yeah. That means that means there was a stone he was using, and I don't think it was the brown stone. That's such an uncommon looking stone. I don't think you could even find something like that. You know, like it's a Precambrian iron mm-hmm. banded formation, which doesn't even exist in that area. So it ended up, we've washed it anyway. That's a whole other issue. Yeah. But I, I, I'm just saying, I think I think there's probably pretty good evidence that he used. You know, he could have used one interpreter. Hey, or both. It says he put them both in the hat. And I actually checked sizes of hats. You could have fit the, the spectacles in a hat mm-hmm. of that time. So, I mean, all, 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 the, all I'm getting at here is he clearly was, he was able to translate individual glyphs. That means that he wasn't just, you know, he couldn't just, all of a sudden it reads off. He had to somehow indicate, put his finger on it or, or put, you know, one of the spectacles over the, glyph to know which one was which does that make sense right saying? like so like one glyph at a time specifically yeah right that's the only way he could know whether it read right to left um so anyway okay so <laughs> um we've got uh the handwriting we talked about um and we talked about the anton transcript um yeah this is the broad side um, from 1844, meaning it's like insert in a newspaper. And then they also had the characters in the um, um, article itself. They flipped them sideways. Mm. Uh, the only problem here, they got these ones upside down <laughs> when, they, when they typeset. So it's supposed to be flipped over. Are, are these from the characters document? Yeah, these are the first three lines. Oh, okay. If you look carefully. But the problem is, is you can't tell if you're starting back here, it's like, this is upside down. <laughs> These clips uh-huh. here are upside down because they they flipped them wrong when they typeset. And these are the ones that I mentioned that there are some additional characters shown here, which this is also interesting. I do think this is indicative of, we, we don't really know. Joseph Smith knew there was a break between prefaces, a break in chapters, right? But didn't say chapter. He just knew there was a break. They numbered them after. So there was something on the plates indicative that there was a break of some sort or the start of something oh okay yeah it's kind of interesting how this flags down so i i think that may be what's going on on the plates themselves there's they wrote a little thing different and that would indicate a new section does that right yeah so so it didn't say section number they just would do that and it gotcha um, yeah and so that anyway so they that gives you some additional glyphs because I want to make sure if I'm translating, I got the full text, right? Right. As good as I can get. And uh, sorry, these are up, lined up over here on the left, but you can see these are the additional glyphs. And I gave them just, I did, um, this is from that photograph I talked about. Right. You, you include those there. in your translation and those additional characters. Yeah. Right, yep. Now, Ariel Crawley, he was the one that kind of looked at uh, this early on, early on, I mean, 1942, but, um, and so he assigned numbers to each of the glyphs. And so I just used his numbering conventions. Um, was he a LDS or non-LDS scholar? No, he was, he was an LDS attorney. He ended up being a judge up in Idaho. Okay. And my next door neighbor was like related to him, I thought. <laughs> huh. So, yeah. And he worked on it. He worked... I think Neil mentioned that he worked with uh, Egyptologists too, getting the source material, mostly demotic speech mm-hmm. words and others. But um, and then if you notice, he goes to ninety six and then goes to a hundred. So <laughs> there's four four numbers missing. I don't know what happened there, but and I just gave him convention C. I just put a C dash in front of him. So um. So I mentioned I kind of talked about that. We can assume that. Uh, they were oriented in the original plates in the same fashion because that's a question are these upside down or <laughs> you're looking at a bunch of characters what you know um, but since he did translate them we kind of think you know we know that they go from right to left right the other, the other thing is okay what kind of we know it's a, we know it's some kind of Egyptian reformed you know obviously reformed based on them living somewhere else also through time and also maybe the medium you know the plates could dictate what you know if you're writing with a papyrus brush that's different if you're trying to engrave right so um the the script was most likely logographic because like an alphabet for example english you have 26 
you have some numbers obviously and then some punctuation marks but you don't have a large number of of glyphs right or characters or just letters so alphabetic doesn't have very many syllabic has more um and there's a in the book i kind of talk about the different languages that have that and their total number of glyphs but with these this many different glyphs unique glyphs it's indicative that it's primarily logographic there may be some phonetic um indications on the, the could you explain the word logographic to any listeners who aren't familiar with what, uh, what logogra means? a logograph is a it's a glyph that could be a whole word um mm -hmm. it could even be a phrase what's your first clue of it came to pass okay that's probably a, a glyph right <laughs> i mean right. they probably didn't write it all out it was probably just one because it occurs so often and repeats that it's probably just one glyph form but yeah and so like in chinese you have um basically glyphs that um, they do have some phonetic elements but it, you almost have to memorize the meaning of the glyph in order to be able to read it so it's not you can't really sound it out necessarily and what, what would be your, your response to um for example i believe whenever i listen to john lundwall i, I haven't listened to the full episode on Mormonish. uh his views are it's an alphabetic script um what what I would really, be... i don't i don't watch much of his but he did agree with he he kind of mentioned my name a few times and he said he agreed with me on the that it is logographic so i don't know if that's oh did he okay that maybe, hurt, I'm, I don't know if that maybe i'm mistaken i thought he referred to it as a alphabet alphabetic script uh but i've not watched the full episode no the hebrew is hebrew is an alphabetic script even the paleo hebrew so you know i i don't know he his I, I he was talking about the plates and other things. He's not a metallurgist. I didn't really listen that closely. I commented on I commented on one of their episodes and just got called a racist and everything. So I decided, you know, it's not a oh. podcast. It's very open minded. So <laughs> also the comment, the comment. It looks like all the commenters are not really. I've never I've never really involved in that podcast. So right, um, they, invi they invited me to come peer review him. You know, I'm like nobody podcasts are not peer review i mean <laughs> i mean the problem is is on all this stuff it doesn't give any citations really so that's why my book you have completely cited i use complete academic resources and all that so i don't mind doing podcasts but i don't like that's why i have a book first so people can actually go look at it right yeah no i get it and um i think i'll have to watch because i think they've done a specific episode on the characters document which i've not watched um so maybe between part one and part two if there's any questions i have from there as i could always uh ask well I, he said something like oh jerry grover's identified these numbers he goes i just disagree I'm like okay why <laughs> you don't you don't provide you know i give you the citation i give you everything where it shows it in hieratic so i'm like and that's you know the reality is i mean this has been out for eight years nobody's really been able to say it's incorrect as far as the use of the hieratic dictionaries and the forms and all that now you can disagree with well maybe I, i'm gonna ask you some questions i'm gonna save them towards the end about what other people have had to say about your work but i'll save them more towards the end yeah um, they usually just say i don't know i'm not convinced or whatever most of them haven't even read it <laughs> that's the problem i always say have you read it no well okay um let's see uh yeah so it it's kind a of like graphic script right uh, when deciphering unknown text initial step is to render a basic meaning not to figure out all the grammar and syntax right uh you know so that's what's what it does right okay okay we're back okay so that kind of gives you the premises for attempt starting to attempt the translation looking at a logographic text um, we're looking for probably some Mesoamerican influence of some sort, and perhaps some Hebrew. Um, the primary sources used, again, I used only academic sources. This isn't me just creating something in my mind. These are all the glyphs are, are found in one of these, for the most part, sources. So you have Palestinian hieratic. <laughs> Um, which is uh, by Stefan Wimmer, Wimmer, um, 
and that's uh there was hieratic used in in the palestine area uh, at the time of lehite's departure we don't know how much he mostly has found uh, he's compiled all of its numbers and weight measurements there's some additional words and things and then there's also some articles thinking that there was some scribal schools of egyptian earlier on so that's interesting I, I remember me and neil talked about that as well like that presence in jerusalem around the time of lehi of uh egyptian and palestinian hieratic uh which, right. which is quite interesting because that's something in which have been i think uh maybe more of a shallow criticism but like uh you know jews coming over and writing reformed egyptian uh there's no basis for that doesn't make any sense but there there was that presence there in jerusalem at that time right so i, I used that one first if they had it right because that's i'm trying to use the source that maybe is closest to what the lehite group might have had again a lot of this may be off the brass plate so who knows how far how far back it goes in terms of mm -hmm. egyptian and there's another one for hieratic it's um Mueller's Haratis Palagrif. I mean, I can't pronounce it, especially with my voice, but, but it's basic <laughs> German. It's in German, as is the other one. Uh, I don't think I could help you there. I thought it looked yeah. German. <laughs> <laughs> so this one has basically all of the hieratic glyphs. And and so what you have to do, you have to go through the glyphs, identify what they are. Mueller assigns a number to each hieratic glyph. Then you have to convert that glyph to the monumental glyph, there's an index, and then all the dictionaries are in these mon monumental Egyptian glyph, you know, like the temple glyph. So you, you, you do, it's not as easy to translate as something else, because you have you have to go through a couple different steps to get to the dictionaries, which I just use the standard dictionaries, Faulkner and other variations of Faulkner, Vigus. I did use Budge a little bit. People don't like that one, but I had a couple couple words out of there. And then for the Demotic University of Chicago Demotic Dictionary, and the Demotic Dictionary is built basically on top of or references the Demot Demotis Glossar by Erickson. So those are the ones I use for Demotic. So these are standard, very standard translation um, right. resources. And, and as I mentioned, you have your hieratic and Demotic, they're types of simplified or shorthand cursive forms of Egyptian hieroglyphs. Yeah, and even the hieratic, even if they talk cursive, hieratic's not very cursive-y, uh, depending on, some kind of has a little bit, but like the Rhine papyri, others, they, they look just like kind of the Book of Mormon standard type glyphs, so. Okay. Uh, so the general strategy was identification and translation, is identify the number, this is again, I noticed the numbers, so I'm saying, okay, I'm going to look through and find numbers. Is So I just kind of had find them in Palestinian hieratic, find them if it's straightforward, if there's Mesoamerican forest sources that have straightforward that number, um, and then go to Egyptian hieratic or demotic, and then evaluate forms that may be variants, like similar, but maybe they're slightly variable, and evaluate unnamed numerals, characters with a numer within a numeral sequence, and evaluate characters on the ends of number sequences. That's where I'll get into the calendrical stuff. The other thing I noticed is there were uh, there was something different. There were like these dots. They were using dots, and so I knew I'd have to figure out what what's the dots. What are the dots doing? I also had to figure out the numerical notation, which is are they starting big to small? Are these place numbers? Um, meaning, like we say, one hundred and twenty-five, right? One one hundred, two twenties, five ones. Mm -hmm. But Roman numerals are different, right? You add them all up. So right. it's called additive cumulative. And so there are different kinds of number notations. And so we need to kind of understand what Egyptian does and maybe Hebrew. So anyway, these are the straightforward identification of the numbers. Um, the number one, I don't include, um, uh, that's a, dots are used as a known number one in Egyptian. I don't really have any examples, but. The number nine is the bar dot nine. What they do in Mesoamerica is you have um, the bars of five, and then the dots um, or ones, and then if you do if you complete another one, then you have two bars. Um, this is interesting because it's not a Maya form. Uh, Maya forms had the dots on the top. This one is the Teotihuacan or Isthmus of Tehuantepec form that's found in Isthmus of right. Tehuantepec. 
So it's a different. Form. That would have been north of where the mines were. Yeah, and west. So these are the these are the characters document um, glyphs, and then you can see the number two. These are just all examples out of the demotic. The way Erickson does, he just lists he lists all the different. This is the Ptolemaic period, so they list them by periods. You know, looks a bit like either a four or a Y to me. That's right something. there, you go. You're right into the the English. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. What I'm saying is these obviously look, but these this is demotic, right? So right, yeah, say yeah. It looks like English. Well, some glyphs do. It's just. Uh -huh. It's actually the English, of course, people don't realize the number system derived from Egyptian and Greek. And so we actually have a reformed number system too. We're not, we're not, it's not like we didn't borrow. Mm. Then you have the number three. Again, the characters example here. Uh, number four, you know, this is the source material from Erickson and the um, Chicago Demotic Dictionary. Like I said, number five, that was just a standard. I could I recognize that obviously right off the bat. So so these here, these three, that's what's on the characters document. That's what's yep. on the characters document. And then these are the symbols for my mouses that are the characters that you're comparing to in Egyptian yep. hieratic. Right out and the right out of the source material. So Got this, you. this number five, that's Vimmer. So it came out of the Palestinian hieratic. That, that's a, it's all Palestinian hieratic in that is, is pretty much the same as regular hieratic for that number. But and in my book, I actually go through and look, look at all the forms and tell you what time periods they came from. Because that was another question after I wrote the first book as well. Would these all have been available to Lehigh or not? So mm. um, number six, this is one from the that other, you know, oh, like the that, newspaper. Yeah. So I got a B. And then, and that part of the part of the problem, like in Vimmer, there may be only one or two examples of it. So uh, there's not because there is variation in the Egyptian, right? I mean, it wasn't like everybody wrote the same. There are different scribal schools, too. So number ten, that was pretty. That, that's like I said, that was pretty obvious to me when I looked at it. I was like, oh, that's a ten. Yeah, it looks quite similar. Yeah, and then you've got you know number twelve from. Uh, that's from a lean papyri. Yeah, that one looks very similar to to that. Yep, cliff there, that yeah. character. Again, you may have a little bit of a slant, but that may have been just the person writing it. Mm -hmm. you know, he may have just had a. Yeah, it looks like very cursive the way they've done it. Yeah, Wetner may have. I want to say he may have been used to writing, you know, on a slant, so he maybe didn't write it. But okay, number fifty again looks like a three, right? <laughs> so, yeah it does yeah you oh, can there argue you go. See, Jones, <laughs> for yeah. a weird question mark the first one but yeah yeah quite, so, but quite here, like a three yeah but here's all the number 50s you can see there's variations the way that they've he's written gotten them out of the he's copied them off of um in this one glossar the erickson has copied them off of different papyri right so he's, he's writing all these different ones or what he's getting that number off a of different papyri so it's telling it's kind of giving you the range Mm. Of, of the form of it right number a thousand you can see that's pretty close and you've got these forms here looks like a hook or an upside down question yep. mark <laughs> uh this one's pretty interesting you know you got the four with a little curly six on top and that's a number two thousand um that's the form of it and spiegelberg and then erickson and Chicago Demotic Dictionary, so that matches pretty well. I feel like that's quite a specific looking character, like the, like yeah. looks like a four, but then the little sort of line like that over it, like the right. hook. Yeah. That's quite an interesting one. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. Even the the ones that are a little more complex match pretty well. Which, yeah, and that's kind of what I'm saying. You can, anyone can go look this. I'm not. There's nothing. <laughs> you haven't seen anything so far that is just not right out of the, the academic materials. Right. That's a half. Um, this is a third. Again, pretty almost pretty exact there. Mm. And then I didn't I didn't on this uh, ordinal number one the line I didn't list. There's so many examples of it. I mean that's not even a question. Anybody? Um, okay, that one's not. That, that, it's, it's, it's ubiquitous. I just didn't. Um, okay. 
you know, I just said, okay, that's not, no one's going to worry about the form of that. I run, anybody recognizes an Egyptian that it's an ordinal number one. Okay. So then I have a little bit of variant, right? So this one, I have a number 10, but I got a dot in it. And as I figured out, it's actually a 10 with a one. So you've got 11. Um, because the Same dot thing. means one, doesn't it? Yeah, there. Now, um, but it's it, the dots can be either one, ten, or times by a hundred. It's interesting, depending on where they're at. Oh. Uh, so you have a three with a dot, that's a ten. And the 60, you got a six with a ten up here. So it's basically a multiplier, multiplier by ten. So anyway, I Again, this was, I was able to figure it out because these are not, there's only a few of these, right, in the text. And I kind of knew what the number was doing. So I was like, okay, it's got to be that number to match the Book of Mormon text to make that number be correct in the text. You know, have a date that actually falls correctly. And it was consistent, right? So I'm seeing the consistency of the dots. Uh, variant of nine, again, you got a nine, they've cut the tail off and the dot. So it's in 19. So the dots, a, again, a 10 there. Hmm. And here you see, let's go to this middle one first. These are the um, forms of 80. Um, in, But they match kind of the 40. But what I was seeing was the 40, the, you've added, they've added dots to the 40. That gives them the 80. And it's similar to this archaic form of the glyph so so and that's it that's egyptian hieratic that th th this is an archaic form of these are hieratic um this is a this is an archaic form of oh. a number it's not really hieratic it's just found like a couple instances of it so it's an interesting one right that um but anyway it works out pretty perfectly that's 40 that's 80 and then you have four, the number four, you can see. Um, but then the dot, again, takes it when it's on the very top. It's basically times it by 100. Mm. So. so the location of the dot depends on if it's like a, a one or like a 10 or a 100. Yeah, yeah. So okay, that's, yeah, and again, this took me a while to figure out. It wasn't like. I, I know I know it's doing something. And there there are a number of systems that have the dots and diacritic things, so to do similar things. Not really in Egyptian. Egyptian a little bit in some of the measurement, like um, measuring of grain, has a few things like that. So anyway, and then multitude, uh, one million or a multitude that's translated that way in in Egyptian. Um, this is the um, kind of the form. It's flipped a little bit, so. And then one seventh here, you can see that. Again, slightly different, but. Mm. The number 30 and 300 were interesting cases because I'm like, I'm not really finding this very much. I found it in like number of talents or some kind of strange reference in Egyptian. But after the first book, I was actually doing research on the Jaredite departure. And so I was looking at the glyph forms and I found it there. Very interesting enough, number 30 and number 300. And to pair at 300, it's, it's higher up. So it depends on where you place it. Same thing. And they also use dots too. And so this is, I think this is probably where it came from. Um, so you have Sumerian proto cuneiform where they'll take the dots a 10 put it inside that counts as a 10 10 months so they've got these little um ways they use the dots hmm. e equaling 10 so. and this is sumerian proto cuneiform mm -hmm. about 2500 bc right so that's 10, 10 days that's 10 months they put it inside and it changes it to months from days so they're doing something the dots changing value right and so then you have, you know, dots of 10, then you put it inside 10 more. It's the, the Crocodile form is very complex in its number system. It depends on what you're counting. So if you're counting calendar, it's different. If you're counting wheat, it's different. If you're counting animals, they have a different number. So 
they have a whole series of number systems. So that actually is kind of curious to find that also protonic protocaneiform has similar to the Mesoamerica in terms of bar dots and also tallies, these tally marks. I don't know that it came from there, but it's certainly curious that it have a similar system. I mean, I do think there's some influence. And I go into that in the book. I actually compared the Aztec number system with the Sumerian protocaneiform. form. It's some are exactly the same. Hmm. So then you have this number 20, right? So you got two dots inside of the shell glyph. Yeah. Uh, makes a 20, just like we saw in the protocaneiform. form. Uh, the two dots would be two, and then... Well, they, yeah, they'd be tens. So you have a 10 and a 10. Ah, yeah. So again, it's you have to kind of know which number it's talking about. And then the uh, Epa Olmec, they don't have the exact... I mean, I'm saying, can I find this in Mesoamerica? Because that's a shell glyph um, in Mesoamerica, but it doesn't have quite the... It doesn't have the dots inside, but that glyph is similar to a shell glyph. Epa Olmec has something kind of like it, but that hasn't really been translated yet. They think it means month. So uh, maybe similar... Do you have a number, but is that from the Olmec civilization? Uh, Epo, Ep, Epo Olmec, Epo Olmec, Epi Olmec. Olmec. So that would be oh. like 200 BC or something, maybe a little earlier, yeah, earlier than that. Uh, it was kind of basically the demise of the Olmec was around 400 BC, and then you had the Epo Olmec just in a little area, um, up north of the Tuxlas, Tres Apotes, and then they they existed, I don't know, like 400 AD or something like that. Um, hmm. but it's interesting because they it's interesting because when they went on the, the limhide expedition it says they got the plates from either the people that were destroyed or a remnant of the people so i think they got it from them is what i, I think happened um, and that's probably where you had like the records of the of the early stuff the evil evil records of the jaredite oaths and stuff like that probably came up through some type of Olmec connection because it occurs when they go into the land northward that's when you start seeing that and that's where the Olmec were so okay. again, there's a, it's just a side issue but uh and, you got, and then you also have like a number nine rebus which so you it's got nine tallies and in texcoco they, they use similar form that's um up in the aztec area and as I mentioned, the number nine, you see that in Teotihuacan with the bar dot nine. Right, right. And that would be like the number 11. I mean, it's not the same number, but it's just telling you the form. that They probably the dots on the bottom. Okay. And then the number 400, like I mentioned, you have a four, that's straightforward Egyptian. Then you got this dot, and it, it, it equivalates to 400. And in Mesoamerica, you have the year sign, which is similar or identical in form. You have a dot, and then you have your V. The Aztec glyph for 400 is similar, you know, kind of similar. Um, and the reason that it corresponds with 400 is because the 365 Mesoamerican year, according to the experts, almost certainly originated as a period of 400 days. So it actually correlates to what a Mesoamerican number. Does that make sense what I'm saying there? Mm hmm. And so, you know, this is a number set, uh, which was, okay, I figured this one out, and it was actually the death date of King Benjamin. So, okay. And then the glyph following says something, uh, you know, ascend to the eternal land. So it clearly it's looking like the death date of King Benjamin. As I figured each one of these out, I could place them. One thing we know is like the Book of Mormon, you don't have more than 600 years, 609, because the first calendar only goes to 609 second before 20 you might get a thousand if you add them together right under some calendrical system but you're not looking at huge numbers in the right calendar, right if you're looking for dates interesting thing too is i found and, and so i was like looking at the notation so you got 429 but they're putting uh no they're putting this five and ten they're doing different things with it um and yeah there we go let's see i'm gonna go back yeah so what, what this is basically okay i take the document and you've got blue these are the number sequences 
that you can find if you know those numbers. Red is it? And then I get into the surround. There's there's these glyphs that are associated with the numbers or next to the numbers that are doing something, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, anyway, as I figured out, they they actually match the date system in Mesoamerica that the Maya used in terms of um, their indicators. So you have count, and we'll get into this. You have in initial series, introductory glyphs. They add that first. Then you have um, interior glyph date indicators. That means you count uh, backwards a certain year, a distance number indicator. That is your base year. Posterior is is the number you count after the distance number. This is very simplified. And then you have period ending transition glyphs. Those are glyphs that end a certain period of time, uh, like a king's reign or something like that. Okay. Okay. Now there's there's a summary of the sequences, so you can see kind of how they add up. Now in this situation, the five and the ten are multiplied, which it, that happens in Egyptian. So it's but the interesting thing is you have these five and tens in front. This looks a bit like algebra to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like if you go to Greece. I was in Greece. I'm like, this is not a language. It's math. You know, <laughs> I'm walking around. <laughs> Delta, epsilon, all that. So essentially, yeah. So you, it's cumulative additive. That's what the system is. So that's how they classify that kind of number system. And as you can see, um, the dates... Um, and we'll show, I mean, I, I can't get, you'll see it in the text in the later when we do another episode, but they do the dates match certain events, right? Or certain right. periods of time. And, uh, but this, this was interesting because in Maya, in Mayan, it's not in the written form of Mayan, but in the spoken form of numbers, they actually use a five and a 10 or 15 in front of the other numbers. And they're just kind of subtracting them out. Now it doesn't do it here, but so it's actually a form that is Mesoamerican. Um, the other thing I figured out, um, not in the first book, but in the second book, because I was looking at it, I was like, this is kind of weird why you would have up here a six and a 13. Um, why are you adding 40 and 13 to get 53? It's just curious. I'm like, what? what why are they doing that? And as it turns out, what I figured out is, is they're actually preferentially using the Hebrew and Mesoamerican sacred numbers. So you have five, seven, and ten. That's in the you see that in the Bible, right? Is the Hebrew. And then Mesoamerican, they're based on lunations of the moon, but you have uh nine, thirteen, um uh twenty or multiples of twenty. So you got forty and also nineteen. And then this is kind of interesting because it, this was the um, 24 plate glyph. So you have five, nine, 10 equals 24. And the number nine in Mesoamerica is the number of death, nine underworlds of the nine gods of the underworld. And then Book of Mormon to see that because nine months, Coriantumr dies, nine years, Nephi has disappeared, 72 disciples. Or 72 years that the disciples said they would live and then die. That's a multiple of nine. But it's also interesting. The number 24 is also interesting because you see that also in the Book of Mormon as a founding and destruction date. You have 24, you have Jared and brother of Jared and his 22 friends. So you have 24 family groups. King Orihad had 24 sons, the first king, the Jaredites. And then, um, it's been calculated by Sorensen that probably the first group of Nephites that broke off had 24 in them. That would be in 116. We don't really have that. And then you have even the disciples, another 72. That's 24 times three is 72. So it's actually found in that number. And then, you know, the last battle, you had 23 named battle groups and then one battle group fled to the South. It doesn't say they were all killed. So you got 24 battle groups. And then the day before, you know, the last ones left, there were 24 of them, right? So the number, it's that's actually kind of a Book of Mormon sacred number. 
or it's not. And of course it's 12 times two. So you could say it's an Hebrew relation because 12, you know, is 12 disciples, 12 <laughs> apostles. So there's, there's things going on with the numbers. That's kind of fascinating. Okay. Uh, and just to pause, just to make sure that I'm fully understanding and for listeners. So you're comparing um, a lot of the, the characters on the characters document that these are numbers that look very similar to say Egyptian hieratic or demotic, um, maybe yeah. some Mesoamerican glyphs. And you're saying here that they're using sort of like the Mesoamericans were like dating sort of system or structure. Well, is that not, not, not yet? Yeah. yeah, we'll get into that. They are using oh. the Mesoamerican, but the numbers themselves, how they add, they're, you know, because you're they're adding up all these things to make the number. Yes. Yeah. They're actually preferentially using sacred numbers where they can in the number sequence to add up to the total number. Oh, sacred number. Okay. Yeah. So 24, you have nine. Again, the 24 plates, that's the plate rebus. Yes. Yeah. So you have 10, five, which those are Hebrew sacred numbers. And if you're LDS, you probably know what those are. If you think about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Why you know why they they're Egyptian, right? But compass and square, but compass in the square, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Anyway, so that that so these are not the, the number system is actually very religious, is what I'm saying. It's it's which is very Mesoamerican, you know. If the Maya numbers are all gods or head variant of gods and in, integrated into them, you know, they can substitute. So it's a very you know, they've, and, and you know, the Hebrews did it later. It's called gemat, Gematria, I guess. Again, if I pronounce it right, Gematria, where the actually Hebrew, they, they didn't use Hebrew for the numbers in the later Hebrew after the exile are made up of the letters. So the letters in Hebrew are different numbers. So that's why all these guys are looking in the Bible saying, oh, this word adds up to this number, you know, because they take the letters, convert them to numbers, and then make all these, you know, interesting you know did they use that not so i do think there was number play going on with uh at the time of lehi's departure probably we don't really have any text to speak of but um and also as america they just fiddled around with numbers a lot okay and there, here's where I talk about it so interesting is the nephite number system gives preference to the hebrew and mesoamerican sacred numbers mm. and then so I'm not saying the Nephites are Maya, but they're there. So they are there. You can see the Mesoamerican setting. The number system has been influenced by where they're at. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. No, it's like with 24, <laughs> you think they would use like, say, two tens and a four. But they're, what was it? A 15 and nine and. Yeah. And 15 and nine, was it? Well, it was 10, 10 five and nine. 10, five and nine. And nine. Okay. Right. All sacred numbers. So. That's what I'm saying. They preferentially use them. Right. It's kind of fascinating. Hmm. And I don't get into it here. I'll get into it later, but you actually, I actually took that fact. And I said, okay, I wonder if I can see any use of the sacred numbers in the Book of Mormon itself. Okay. We don't have the underlying glyphs, right? I don't know. But in the Maya codexes, the divinatory codexes, they, uh, preferentially they make these um, they have in their number sets in the beginning like the Dresden Codex or whatever where they have gaps and intervals and they, they make the gaps and intervals match their sacred numbers and so I said you know what you got all these funky dates in 4th Nephi right it says the 51st year the 59th year when nothing's happening and it's like why is he counting that way anyway I laid them all out it's in the book and they all match the intervals of the sacred numbers. So you find all the sacred number intervals in 4th Nephi. And actually in the rest of the Book of Mormon, you do. there's evidence of it too. So it, it, really, okay. is a, it really is a divinatory, it really is a Mesoamerican divinatory codex that Mormon has made. He's using that technique, which is right. nobody, nobody's really looked at. But And also in Ether, same thing, Moroni did it, because it only has... It only has like, okay, this king lived this many years. Why is he keep picking out that king? You know, or this reigned this 
but he's only using numbers that are like divisible by 19 or sacred numbers. So even Moroni is doing it. Even though it's not a year count in ether, he uses it in the date. He just preferentially puts, includes dates that have that feature. The, Interesting. Or, or year. Yeah. So the, the, yeah. they want to use like the sacred symbols or glyphs. Yeah. Yeah. The sacred numbers. Right. right. Because, hmm. because they mean different things to them. I mean, you see that in the Bible, the number 10, you know, the number 10 in the temple, there's 10 curtains, 10 cubits, 10 all over the place. Right. 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 So we all, we know there's. Okay. So the calendrical markers. So when looking at their form Egyptian, one needs to remember that when engraved um, on the plates that, that have been embedded in Mesoamerican culture for a hundred thousand, for a thousand years. Right. So uh, you might expect some influence because of the locale. Now I've got another book out on, on the calendars and I look for a lot of, to see if there was any like cycles of like long count and anything. I didn't find any cycle. So, like, so that first paragraph you're saying that when Mormon and Maroon I were engraving on the plates that they would have been embedded or immersed in the Mesoamerican culture for a thousand years. That that would have influenced how they would, were well, yeah the reform of Egypt the reformed Egyptian would have, right? That they right. Up, okay. Right? It's just like it's just like English. People don't realize there's like letters that aren't in there anymore. Like Yoth and Thoth or what Yog, what Yog. I mean, in English has dropped letters too from the 1600s. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there's I meaning our language isn't even the same as it was, not even pronunciation, but it doesn't even have the same letters it had back then. Right. Also, so so anyway, so you you'd expect some kind of some kind of difference, right? You're just not looking for straight Egyptian. And that's been a lot of the problem. People say, oh, is this Egyptian? They go to some Egyptologist. Oh, I'm looking at it. It's it's not an Egyptian. And they've said that. It's kind of like, it's not Egyptian like I would know. And it's like, well, of course, you wouldn't expect it. In fact, if it was, I would expect something's the matter with it. But um, Because it, it being referred to as reformed Egyptian kind of means that it's been it's been modified the language and they said that they would have written in Hebrew if the, the, the plates were big enough. So it's sort of like this shortened modified uh, version of Egyptian. Yeah. And it may have been the medium is what shortened it. Meaning they were carving them on plates. They weren't just writing them on all the paper or anything. They might have, but I'm just saying that the medium of the plates, because you're trying to, they're hard to describe and that kind of thing. You may have shorthanded it. In fact, that's what I found as I was going through, I would, I would start looking for a word or something that I thought was there or a name. And I would always go, I found that if I went to the most compact glyph um, in Egyptian, maybe like a one character glyph for that word, that's what it was. So they're selecting the shortest version of a particular word. And then interesting, the demotic. It's quite yeah, the only time they're using the demotic is when it's the sh it's shorter than the hieratic. It's more, more compact than the hieratic. So I think that's what's driving. They did use a little bit of demotic. You know, you find it, but it's only if it's shorter than the hieratic version. So anyway, I, I do think that maybe the Reformed Egyptian itself, the form of it was dictated by the media. And also it's in Mesoamerica. So there's maybe some, some things that they ad adapted, you know, from the culture. But I do think they were trying to keep the the their religion pure, the language pure from pagan stuff. So I don't think you're going to find, you know, people are looking for all this Mesoamerican, well, I have all this Mesoamerican calendars. It's like, no, the, the Maya calendar was just saturated with their gods and everything and their festivals, their religious festivals, all these kinds of things. So I wouldn't expect them to, in fact, I think they wanted to keep it unique and separate, you know, because it was part of their religion. Again, they're in Mesoamerica, so the calendar, the number forms are important to them. But um, as a religious text, but they didn't want to be like everybody else. In fact, that's the whole message of the Book of Mormon is not to, <laughs> right? Is it's not to become like the surrounding religions. I mean, it doesn't. It doesn't always talk about them. I mean, it has like Order of Nehor, a few others, but it's pretty clear they were surrounded people are getting influenced by other religions or the native religion. Mm. And they were trying to keep it as pure as they could. So I would expect that their records, their whole, their sacred records are not going to include a bunch of stuff about 
gods, you know. Of course, Mormon never talks about what the other religions. He just says, oh, they have their idols and there's idolatry. But he never really says the names of any gods, of the pagan gods. That's right, yeah. Now, I think he doesn't care about them, number one. And number two, they weren't really part of I mean, They weren't part of their religious script. So, okay, so we're looking at... Um, uh, and again, this is kind of what I'll, I'll explain these things, but this is basically telling you these are all numerical or calendrical notations. Which it's interesting because because uh, Crawley he noticed a few things, he noticed numbers too, as did a, a urge uh, Egyptologist William Hayes who was with the uh, New York Museum. Uh, in New York, he noticed number sets too. I think Neil talked about this in my book too, but mm -hmm. I wasn't the first to notice. I wasn't aware of that work when I did this translation, but as I looked up, I was like, oh, they found the same thing I did. Well, that kind of corroborates then. Uh, yeah. You, you seeing it as well. Right. So, so I'm just basically kind of a background. Um, Again, it's not they're not it's not a Mesoamerican calendar system, but they're taking things. Well, I actually think the Maya borrowed from the Nephites, to be honest with you. When you look at the glyphs, you'll see what I'm saying. But so they have a long count calendar which counts every single day. Um that's where, you know, that was the calendar that um you know, in 2012 the world was gonna be destroyed or whatever, because <laughs> the, the long count was hitting a new you know, series kind of thing. So they, it's basically, they count every single day um, in that count. It doesn't really have months and years like we would think of them. It's more of just continually counting. Okay. Which in Mesoamerica, you had different calendars running the same time. Um, so, and we actually, most people don't realize we do too. So, meaning... We, they had religious calendars that just ran continuously. They didn't care what time of year it was. It wasn't it wasn't adapted or modified for the you know the seasons or anything. It just ran. You know these they had these calendars. It just ran. Uh, just like we have people think of our calendar. Oh, we just have one calendar. We really we don't. We have two calendars running concurrently that aren't linked, and then one fossilized. I call it a fossilized calendar. So. We have our year counts, right? Mm -hmm. Every 365 days or whatever. It's we also have, yeah, but we have weeks. The weeks don't match. Don't, you don't adjust the calendar for the weeks just run, right? Sunday, yeah, that's Monday, right. Yeah. Yeah. So you'd say that's a religious, that's a, if, to give some idea, that's kind of what they did in Mesmeric. So you have this festival calendar that just runs. It doesn't care anything what's going on with, with the seasons or anything. Oh, right, right. Yeah. And then, and then we also have what's called a fossil, I call it a fossilized lunar calendar, right? We have months that are roughly equivalent to the lunation of the moon, but we stopped that because that runs independent of the sun, right? The the but we've said, okay, we're, we're not going to run three concurrent calendars, but we still kept these month concepts. And then certain things like Easter, you know, Easter is dictated by the full moon, right? Not not any not the weeks or the so we have this kind of third i call it fossilized lunar calendar that we utilize <laughs> with the months right 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 so and then in, in mesoamerica they had um in their calendrical notation they would um and i'm not going to just read all this but you have an inter initial series introductory glyph tells you that's a date coming and then um then they would have, um, then that it would it would have like a different form, and I'll show you the forms there. And they had supplementary series that were also different um, year counts, calendars that were softened in the glyph form in the date sequences. Okay, so so Mesoamericans had different uh, calendar uh, sort of systems, yeah. and they would have used uh, certain glyphs to sort of illustrate that or yeah to trigger to say okay here's a date in this one and and they'd have a glyph that says here's a date right so they, they have an introductory glyph saying this this number is going to be a date glyph it's right not just a number glyph. 
and then the supplementary series, I don't talk about them because it's not manifest in the character's document. So then they have distance numbers. These are the intervals between dates and the Maya inscriptions. Um, you have a, a, di a distance number introductory glyph that tells you the number is, is going to be, uh, again, this is kind of boring. I get it. <laughs> Sorry about the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You want to take a yawn break? That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, again, it's kind of hard to make this super exciting, but it is important to kind of go through. I actually, it. I'm, I'm finding quite quite interesting. I'm trying to sort of like wrap my head around it, so I, I'm actually quite intrigued. And that's why in a podcast you can't. And that's why I put it up, and then the, people need to get the book if they really want to dive into the details. Yeah, and I think especially like a podcast like this, because I typically like listening to podcasts because. Most of the time, it's easier to just do it like while you're driving in the car, if you're at the gym or washing yeah. the dishes. But I think to really get art, like get art, a lot out of this, uh, this podcast or this interview, you kind of would have to watch and really probably even pause the screen and yeah. to read through and follow along. Yeah, if you if you do this at the gym, you'll probably die on the running machine or something. So. <laughs> <laughs> Put them to sleep. <laughs> Yeah, or ground or something. but And then they have these posterior and anterior date indicators. That tells you whether to count forward or backward from a particular date. So they would like say, okay, the king was crowned in this date. Then they'd use an indicator to so go back in time, say he was born on this date. And then they'd use the, the posterior date indicate to say he died on this date. So they kind of use a base date of when he was made king, and then they use these symbols to tell you whether to count forwards or backwards in time. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and so here's a simplistic. Ronald Reagan was president in 1982. Then it came to pass after four years, he was reelected. So they would use a post, you know, you'd say, okay, this is using the king. And, and, and these glyphs have been identified as the came to pass glyphs. These are the ones everyone talks about. Uh, it says, oh, we found the came to pass glyphs. The Mayanists have called these the came to pass glyphs. Right. That's interesting. So, the, so yeah. the, the Mayans had their own it came to pass glyph. Yeah. And it's the oh. same. And, and, I'll, and I'll show you the connection. That's um, interesting. I mean, I, and, and in my translation, I didn't put it came to pass. And I, did, I just put since or something, meaning I didn't try to recreate the Book of Mormon in my translation because there were, there were more it came to passes, but I just. I said, I'm I'm not translating to Book of Mormon language to early modern English slash King, King James Bible slash, you know, right. we, we know it's complex, right? So I'm like, I'm not, I can figure out Reformed Egyptian, but I can't tell you, I can't put that in the language of the Book of Mormon because it's a complex structured language. It has, you know, Hebrew, chiasms, all this other stuff in it. Uh, so, you know what I'm saying? So my translation was not to like, everyone says, oh, should I have all these came to pass? I says, well, I could have put them in, but I'm just putting it in more modern English translation, right? Aye, simple speech. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't, I, uh, you know, I didn't have the interpreters. Somebody told me, you shouldn't even have translated this. You don't have the interpreters. And I'm like, well. Well, that was a question I was going to bring up. I was going to bring it up at the end, but maybe I'll ask it now, because I think there's a passage in the Book of Mormon uh, and you correct me if I'm getting the context or I'm paraphrasing, but where uh, I think it's Mer it's either Mormon or Moroni that says that no man like knoweth our language um, and that no one can sort of interpret or translate it except using the interpreters prepared by God. So my, my question would be, somebody might say like this well, uh, language of reformed Egyptian cannot well, be said... translated by secular means. That's why the the Nephi interpreters were prepared. But, yeah, I think it says no man knows our languages, but it, yeah, the interpreters were prepared. But of course, they didn't, no man at that time had it, knew their language, you know. Nobody they knew knew it. He was just speaking for, and, and, and at the time of Joseph Smith, this stuff wasn't known, mm -hmm. right? Heretic Egyptian wasn't yet translated. So, right. That's true. Yeah. And I know that's where people are coming from. And, I put that in the front of my book. I'm not starting a new church or something. You know, <laughs> it's not like I have this, you know, some revelation. <laughs> and of course, if I started a church, but only three people would join or something. But <laughs> so uh, I'm just saying this is using academic techniques to translate these Egyptian glyphs, right? Right. And, and, and I, may not, I may I may have missed a few things, right? There's cultural things. Honestly, 
based on what I saw, there's even stuff in the Book of Mormon didn't make it through from off the plates, cultural things, I think. You know, the divine translator didn't try to take every Mesoamerican meaning and put it into the text. You're, you're trans, and that's what I would do, too. I'm translating uh, a text that's going to be used all over the modern world and translated all these languages. I'm not going to put some archaic, weird thing that nobody understands what it is. Only only ancient Mesoamerica understands it, right? Mm. Uh, doesn't mean that there's not clues in there about some cultural things, but but that's why people say, well, the tight translation. I'm like, well, the reality is if you're translating any of these ancient texts, you're going to, they've got a cultural, they're going to have a cultural element to them. And so you kind of do have to change them a little bit to put it make more relevant, like the audience that you're translating for. Yeah. No, I, well, like not, somebody in the 19th century who's not super educated needs to be able to read it. Right. So, you know, I mean, I'm sure if the plates were discovered and somebody was able, just like I've done, it's like complicated, right? <laughs> I mean, you're going to have the whole structure, all chronology structure is not the same on the plates as we have in the Book of Mormon. That's what I'm telling you. It's, it was done under a Mesoamerican chronological structure. And so you'd have, if you did it that way, you'd have, it would just be a mess for us to understand. Interesting, Sumerian is the only one that does it even in that way. <laughs> so maybe that's where it came from with Jaredites. I don't know. But, but all I'm saying is it, it it's, it's apparent to me anyway that that obviously the translation's managed. It's managed. I'm not saying it's not on the plates, but they've had to whoever translated it, and I just think it's a divine translator, uh, has had to well, make accommodation for the and you do that when you're trying. I mean, I've translated all kinds of stuff, legal documents, computer th things. You have a you have a source language and a target language, right? So you pick the language, but you also have to like adapt it to. You know, if I got a computer manual and it's going to be for the operator, well, I'm not going to translate it the same as if it's for the computer programmer because the operator doesn't necessarily know all that, all the terminology, right? So I'm, I'm just saying it's, it's not unknown in translating to have that kind of translation. So, so as we get into this, don't, you know, it may seem confusing and the Book of Mormon isn't structured this way, but it is what's on the plates. I see. So, um, so these introductory uh, series of glyphs within the characters document, as I mentioned, Ep Olmec had them, Maya systems have them. It's called an ISIG. The Mayanists don't really know what, doesn't know the direct meaning of them or what they're supposedly doing other than marking a calendar or something, marking a calendar date. Um, and anyway, this is just David Stewart, who's a, Pretty famous Mayanist talking about that. Um, the interesting thing is all of the, the character document ISIGs, which is identifying the calendar they're on, also uses sacred numbers. Kind of fascinating. So this is in front of the Lehigh departure calendar, meaning when if it's giving a date in the Lehigh departure, which is the 600 years or 609 years. If you remember, they departed and then they counted 609 years. And then they changed their, their calendrical count nine years retroactively, they said. So so there's actual, the, the, so there's a reign of the judges calendar. There's a reign of the king's calendar. There's a Lehigh departure calendar. There's right. also the change, the coming of Christ calendar is what I call it, meaning when Christ, um, the birth of Christ triggered, you know, another calendrical system, right? Because he started, so it goes from, you know, the like, the destruction happens in the 34th year. Well, that's the 34th year of the coming of Christ calendar, not the Lehigh departure calendar. Right. Uh, ah, yes. There's different calendars. Yeah, does that make sense? What I'm saying? Yeah. 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 And so that's kind of interesting. So you have the Lehigh. It's basically three times 200. Um, that's your 200. There's your, your three bars. And then it has two months, which I think is interesting, but I don't, not sure. Um, so that's that, and that falls before the whenever they're using when they use the like the death of King Benjamin, they use that, and that character is the two months is that's in the Hebrew, and this is a Olmec ISIG, um, kind of has some similarities, Ep Olmec ISIG, not Olmec, excuse me, 
as found on the Tuxa statue. So you can see there's some characteristics of the that seem similar. This is the Reign of the Kings calendar introductory glyph. You've got a 50 and then a 5. That starts the Kings. And if you notice, Jacob 1.1 1, 1 says, For behold, it came to pass that 55 years had passed away. Um, it says, Now I'm going to be old. And started, it says, According to the Reign of the Kings. So that started, that's when that calendar started, was the death of Nephi. And then it talks about them having these other Nephi's, right? After that. Yeah. This is an interesting seven tribes introductory glyph. I don't, this is something new. You have a seven. This is a, a glyph for tribe or file or troop. That's straight out of the Egyptian. And later on, I'll show you that's, that's the word for it really. So the Nephi to Jaredite. Yeah. Cause you don't really hear the word tribe in the book of Mormon, but there's a lot of ites, you know? Yeah. And the Ammonite, Ishmaelites, Zoramites. Right. And a file is a religious tribe, really. That's what file means, you know, in, in the English. So as a clan. Um, anyway, there was this seven tribes introductory glyph, and then it ends, it has a period ending. So it actually, something we don't have it was in the 116 pages. So, um, uh, I, you know, again, that's, and of course we know there were seven tribes in the Book of Mormon. So makes sense. Um, and here's the, Reign of the Judges, again, another seven, which, again, you've got probably the, you know, the seven tribes each have a judge. Just, the Book of Mormon doesn't specifically say that, but that's probably the case. You know, it talks about informing the judges. So the coming of Christ, introductory glyph, <clears throat> it can mean infinity, eternity, endless dance, joy, jubilation in the Egyptian equivalent. So again, it's That's quite an interesting looking glyph. It's very yeah. And, and what's happened is they've stylized the. That's why the introductory glyphs are not just straightforward numbers. They've stylized them, so it uh -huh. has made it a unique kind of. Oh, I don't even know how to describe that glyph. <laughs> it's like yeah. a sneak wrapped around a pool. <laughs> That's what it looks like to me. <laughs> yeah, and so you can see kind of similarities here, you know, to the, like the leg coming out and all that. So again, that's one. All right doesn't have a complete perfect match in egyptian but it's right i know what, it, I know what it's doing because it's in front of the date of christ's birth so then these distance numbers what i told you is when they when they're indicating that there's a date that they're going to use the base date to count from there's this funky h glyph with the little six thing and it changes a little bit this is just i did a reflection of it because in egyptian you can flip a back and forth Glyphs can flick back and forth. Sometimes they do it for artistic reasons. Maya do the same. So, so I'm, I'm so I'm saying, okay, I know this is a distance number glyph based on the text of the characters document. Well, let's look at the Maya. What are the DNIGs in the Maya? Well, there it is. They've incorporated as an infix glyph, and they have like the little sixers things too as ordinal counts. So you see that here you know these are all the these are the these are the um you know and this is all known yeah you know, i'm not making this this is pretty much and this is uh distance number glyphs yep these are the dnigs from different places and these are from codexes these are from the stele or carving on the sides of steps or whatever these are the written mm. codexes that they have they these a little different form when they're writing it you know then you can still see that there. Um, and then it's like, okay, so where did that glyph come from? In the Egyptian, right? And that's there it is in demotic. It means another. That's the same thing way that Maya translated is it put an order increase another. Um, in Egyptian too, so so it matches kind of the meaning as well. Hmm. And then I, I some of Brian Stubbs' work you probably heard of Brian. Um, yeah, he, he's a linguistic scholar. Yeah, so he's basically looked at the U.S. Tech and language family, 
and found uh, yes. he, yeah, Hebrew and Semitic in it. Um, also in the Maya, there were early borrowings from the Huat, which is one of the U.S. Aztecan languages that that Mayanists have recognized, you know. And so I'm kind of showing that it actually that same form existed um, in Teotihuacan and other places. So it's not a unique. It's not just unique to the Maya or or the Nephites. Are they able to trace back like when that language like dated to? Was it Aztecan? Oh. Well, not really. I mean, they kind of guess, but they used to have what's called glottal chronology where they said, okay, it changes, language changes at some fixed rate. And so if we can figure out how different it was from the earlier languages, but they've abandoned that because it's so, it's dictated so much by, okay, somebody moves over against another person, another group, and then they get loan words in. And so um, they think at least, you know, six proto U.S. Tekken, thousand BC, six hundred, and Brian's not Brian's work isn't saying it. A U.S. Tekken came from this mix of languages; it's an infusion. So they came in and mixed. Does that make sense? So it's not right. So he like, would have mixed with like sort of the the Mayan languages at the time. Uh, not really the the Mayan. The, it mixed with the or U.S. Aztec. Tekken. Yeah, right. the U.S. Tekken. That's, uh, that's that's what, Aztecs were way later, so there's there was yeah. a proto, right? So, but it's the Aztec like an Aztec spoke Nahuatl, they think, pretty sure. So, mm. I'm pretty sure they're sure. Um, they think the Teotihuacan was, um, also had a form of Nahuatl, Nahuatl, maybe if you want to pronounce the L on it, but so it goes back pretty far, and okay, Quite interesting. yeah, so. And then you have, okay, here's the character's document, posterior data indicator. Again, it's adjacent to these numbers. Um, and you find the same thing. Here is the the PDI of the Maya. You know, it's got this kind of two lines and a line through it. Now, it's not the same, meaning it's an affix. It's only part of their word. So it's not like, okay, they just barred it in straight, which is, that's what some people a couple of Maya people said, Hey, this isn't work. I said, I know it's just a borrowing. It's the borrowing of the, of the glyph form and the meaning, but they've done their own because they have a different language because you, this actually pronounces, you know, you can actually read the Maya in terms of, uh, you know, based on the syllable that the particular glyph is right. So they've just, it's not, and that's why I think it came from the Nephite into the Maya because they, and they incorporated the element or the concept. And I do think we do, I do show some phonetic bringing in um, kind of using Brian's work that there may have been some phonetic borrowing uh, when they borrowed the glyph. Um, and that, this is where it gets into the borrowing, the, the, the Maya PDI and the Egyptian have some similar pronunciation, um, especially in the Nahuatl. So Brian has it, it shows the Hebrew in Nahuatl, and then it looks like it's coming into the Maya as an Ewal. He's got Ewa in the U.S. Tech. And so that's so why I'm saying there's a phonetic borrowing, but I think the origination was, as Brian is showing, is from actual Hebrew. So it went through, it went through Nahuatl first and then into Maya. Does that make sense? Could you explain that one more time for me? I, I feel like I didn't fully. So you had you had uh, you had the term for this word or whatever in in Hebrew and the words or, e or Egyptian e or e Egyptian, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. And so you then this it came to pass is that's how you say it in the Maya PDI cliff, right? Um, in in Egyptian, that a similar word, iwi, means old age, old man. Brian actually shows how it's coming in from the hot. It looks like from the hot. It got absorbed into the hot, and maybe that's the way it got into Maya, meaning it the, the Hebrew or Egyptian first went into the you know, Aztecan language family, got changed a little bit, and then goes into the Maya. So maybe it was a later, you know, so... Again, it's, um, it's not it's even not super the, defined. Even though the Aztecs were sort of after the Mayans. Well, well the Teotihuacanos were, were thought to speak Nahuatl. So they're they're before. They're back in 1500 BC. Uh, right. Okay. Yeah. So it's not coming in from the Aztec. No, it's coming in 
from a proto U.S. Tekken or whatever, you know what? And that's what most most of the Mayanists are now saying. Yeah, there's they're showing some very early Nahuatl or U.S. Tekken going into Maya fairly early. So I'm just saying that this may be one of those. I, again, I'm just pr proposing a pathway because you just have the similarity. It's like, okay, did it go from did the Nephites get it from the Maya, or did the Maya get these calendrical markers from the Nephites? And I'm saying I think it's from the Nephites. Mm. That they borrowed okay. in at least the concept. And so here's your anterior data indicators, series of little crescents. There's one in um, Palenque and a couple other places, like a little snake. Yeah. Or somewhere it's just one. Um, and then you see it. These are the ones in the codexes, the two little crescents. Again, this is, again, the ADI. Um, these little crescents. So... I'm basically saying, yeah, that that's part of their, it's part of that came to pass glyph, but it's not all of it. So it's just a, an affix um, that they've incorporated. So it's kind of a, it's a complex connection is what I'm saying. I, I don't know. I mean, if I had, if I had the plates, that'd be great. I could maybe figure out more, but <laughs> all I've got is what I've got to work with, you know? And so, mm -hmm. um, and it's like, where did it come from? in the egyptian well it looks like it came from this is a scarab this is a hieratic form of those scarab of the scarab this is the monumental scarab this is the hieratic form you can see the little sea surrounding little crescents mm -hmm. uh, that means to to come to pass that's how they translated it in egyptian so as well <laughs> so it's the same translated the same in, in maya um okay does that make sense? So, is that similar to like to the phrase like "and it came to pass," or is it like to happen or for something? Well, it's it can be exist, come into being, became, change, occur, happen, or come to pass. So, to happen or come to pass, those are similar. There's different ways you can say it came to pass. You don't have to say it the way the Book of Mormon did, is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> Very <laughs> redundantly. <laughs> yeah, yeah and it, but that's the term that they used, and it probably is biblical, right? You find it in the Bible. Yeah, that's right. So, so they translated it again with the King James. They could have used since, probably, but they, they just <laughs> used King James Bible version, you know, of huh. form, form of that, right? So, I mean, it's obviously probably more complex than that. I'm just simplifying it here. but <laughs> Or what happened next? This happened next. <laughs> yeah so again but it does mean what i'm saying is that the glyph form which then you know matches your little crescents in the maya it means the same thing in egyptian as it does in the maya that they've borrowed in so hmm. and this is that snake variant i talked to you about in the characters document it's also an adi well there it is in the in the maya same meaning, ADI glyph. It's a snake form. It has little snakes along the side, little snakes. So it's again, it's borrowed in a it, 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 in the codex. It sometimes it sits itself by itself, but in the in the stele, et cetera, it, it actually is attached to the word that it's talking about. There's the number, you know. There's a date number. And the, so you can see it's a my, you know, the it's a number. Will that be 13? Because you got the two lines, yeah. three dots. And then they have head variants too. So uh, anyway, and so in the Egyptian, where did it come from? Well, you have um, the emi means snake. Um, so it's similar to the form. Um, sorry, my voice is dying here. But And then the... No, that's okay. If you need a little break, uh, let me know. Well, we're almost we're almost done here. So oh, that's okay. Yeah, we'll be done here shortly. So the, the then this is the period ND marker in the um that's found in the Book of Mormon or the Cal. Well, here's the Egyptian for behold to see. These are a little bit tricky because this is the seven tribes ending period ending glyph. These are some other period ending glyphs, and so they're not a complete match, but they do match. Um, what the Egyptian might be expecting. Um, this is the reign of judges period ending glyph here. Um, is that the the Christ uh, glyph or yeah, 
yeah, that you know what's that's the funky thing about the characters document is it actually shows you the concurrent calendars. It gives the date of the destruction in the reign of the judges calendar, not in the coming of Christ calendar. Mm. It uses it uses it when he when he comes to the people appears but not the destruction it's the hundred and it's a, actually a new year's day it's, a, it's the first day of the 125th year of the reign of judges that's what the characters document says which actually makes sense because if you look at the themes of the what they celebrated on new year among the jews it's, it's celebrating sinai where they had god speaking from a cloud the name of the holiday the ancient name which means loud destruction and that's in the book so there's some biblical typology going on with the destruction, and that's why the character's document uses that, shows us a New Year's Day. This, again, there's the period ending glyph in the Maya, so it's not exactly the same, but it does have kind of, as you know, as before, you had <laughs> you had some dots here and some lines. There you have dots. These other ones, you do have some line features of the period ending glyph. Again, the Maya were very artistic, right? So they changed, you know, they kind of, they were pretty liberal with their glyphs. They weren't standardized completely. So, And then I, I kind of show the meaning here. So the meaning of that affix is his, hurts, its, and the and you, and the Maya, the corresponding Egyptian glyph means she, her, it, its, you know. So it has the same meaning in Egyptian as it does in the Maya. Mm -hmm. um, in any event so these are some connections uh, it's very in the weeds right yeah <laughs> but it, but it's complex and that's why people can review it if they want and tell me if i'm incorrect but i think it is um pretty straightforward and then the, this is just kind of my you know i have i've written a bunch of other books yes yeah. And uh, we we also did uh, an interview back, what well, was it, August, September time on geology in the Book of Mormon. And you looked at the Mesoamerican geography model and some of the destruction in Third Nephi and sort of like the catastrophe and the, the hazards, you know, correlating very well with an earthquake and uh, yeah. volcanic activity. And then we looked at the Heartland geography model. Those are good episodes, again, kind of very much in depth in geology, but it very, I find them very interesting. And my my new book that's out is Calendars, and it came out last week or week before. It's just Calendars of Chronology, the Book of Mormon, and it actually talks about what caused the Night of Brightness, Signs and Wonders, um, Birth Date of Christ gets into that, kind of identifies an exact date, and then um, talks about a some variety of other things related to the calendars. Some like roots of Jaredite names. Is that like names of some of the Jaredite people, or um, does it get into like specific yeah. names like Kirlums or Qumams? Yeah. Kirlums, Qumams, all of them. Actually, what, what, what again, I kind of work on stuff that nobody's figured out. <laughs> and Jaredite names, nobody's figured out. You go to the Book of Mormon on a Masticon, they don't really have any. And so I said, you know, something's going on here. Yeah, because. I know uh, I've seen, you know, apologists point to like there's some ancient Hebrew or Egyptian names um, in the Book of Mormon, um, right. you know, like uh, Soraya, Alma, uh, and names like Bahorin, uh, Pakumenai, uh, Pahanchi for Egyptian names or even like Mulek. But uh, I've not really seen them talk too much about the Jaredite names. Because they haven't figured, because I took a different approach. I said, you're kind of using a hammer to pound everything. You're looking for names of the old world, right? I mean, one thing, I'm not an apologist, so I don't care to prove the Book of Mormon true or not. A lot of people are, I got to find this name. If I can find it in the old world, it proves the Book of Mormon. I was like, I don't really care. That's great. <laughs> Interesting. But I, I, I'm i just like trying to figure things out. I don't care if it, you, you're saying you wouldn't like if they find like a an altar or a stone near Nahum that said Nephi was here. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't. It's that'd be quite nice. <laughs> yeah, my re my research isn't driven towards proving the Book of Mormon is true. I don't really care about that. I right. just care about figuring stuff out, right? Right. And that's why that's free. I don't, you know, I don't belong to any really of the groups. I'm my own independent researcher, and um, 
you know, and I do think I find interesting things and it's all dab- academic grade. I have it all peer reviewed. I pay for peer review. That's one went to like non LDS Sumerian scholars, you know? So, but what I figured out this one is, is what they're doing is it's looks like they're using Sumerian words and combining them in a Mesoamerican fashion. So, so like Kudalam, Kuda means, um, um uh, um uh, sheep and then lam means mountain and then you have um kuma means a beast uh, like a plow beast to pull plow so it's probably llama and alpacas and then i go through all the metrology meaning the measurements so you have a limna for example in sumerian li la means seven imna means measures that's the way they measure their grain well, Limna, if you look at the calculation in the Book of Mormon, it's seven measures of grain is what it equals. So I kind of show all those making sense in the Sumerian, if you're assuming a Sumerian etymology and combining them in a Mesoamerican fashion. And then I go through all the, because they all mean stuff, right? Akish, the founder of the secret societies, A means power, Kish means netherworld, darkness, you know. Um, so all those names have meanings in, in ether. Hmm. Yeah, and so that's it. I also, I also have I also talk about Hebrew, other newer ones like you know that I found that. Well, and and in the next but this calendar's book, one of the interesting things is because I now know the dates, I can now get exact dates, uh, correlate the Book of Mormon date to an exact date in, on our calendar, and you have like the year before the final battle, a king. Uh, we know that a king came in, uh, like an over king came into. He called and knocked off the king and replaced him, went to a couple other places, knocked off the kings and consolidated power. Literally, the next year is the battle, the final battle, where they said the Lamanites were just innumerable, right? So, and then interestingly enough, the name of the king Aaron that Mormon identifies mm-hmm. um, in, he, in Hebrew, it means conceived or born in flame. We know the Mayan name of that over king, his name is born of fire. So it's actually the same guy. They're just they're putting it in the Hebrew. They're not they're not taking the name in Maya. It's you know Shecock, and they're not taking that and transliterating it. They're taking the meaning and putting it in a Hebrew form. Does so that, that was sense? the name of a Mayan. Did you say like a Mayan king at that time? Yeah, mm-hmm. he was the one that came in and controlled the whole area. And so it was Aaron. You know, that's the king Mormon mentions, right? Uh, um um where was he was that based in wasn't like Te Teotihuacan was that sort of like what well he he had influence. he had influence from Teotihuacan that's what the Mayanists believe he had and they think you know he was they think maybe he was Te, he was a Mayan that was raised you know in Teotihuacan or something because he has Teotihuacan headdress and stuff and so yeah it, it, and basically in the Mesoamerica you have the Teotihuacanos basically equating to the Gadiat, it's more or less. Is kind mm, of, yes, I remember and the, reading that in Brent Gardner's book. Yeah, and the characters document, it has the tribe of wealth and money. That's the Gadiat. That's what it, in Egyptian, that's what it means. So, right. And so you have, but they weren't down there a ton, meaning they were there, but it's not clear. Like, did they have full armies or are they just getting alliances? Seems like they're getting alliances, right? Trade alliances and then getting power because they would make the nobles rich from their trade. And, and it matches up very well with, um, with what the Book of Mormon, because the Book of Mormon says they battled the Gadiantans and the Lamanites up until the treaty. Then they made a treaty with both of them. And Tetuconos, Gadiantans were to the north principally, but, um, but then afterwards, they didn't fight the Gadiantans anymore. They only fought the Lamanites. It was the Lamanites that broke the treaty. And that's one reason they wouldn't go north because they would have violated their agreement with the Gadiantans. And the reason the Gadiantans were fine is because they gave them the narrow neck of land. It basically says that they gave the land southward unto the narrow neck of land, which was the main trade route. So they didn't include that. So the, the Teotihuacanos had access down to where they needed to be. They, they obviously wanted the Nephites out of the way because they weren't paying tribute. And they weren't aligning with them, but they just let the Lamanites do the dirty work and, and maybe they maybe they were behind you know born of fire 
going and consolidating with the intent of attacking the Nephites. I'm not saying they weren't, but it's not overt, right? So does that make sense? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so I want to ask you a question, and this is actually more due with Mesoamerica, but I've got a few questions I want to ask you about the characters document. Because um, one thing like I, I've noticed is reading the Book of Mormon, um, and I, I would I would go with the, I think the Mesoamerica model, I find it the most compelling of the geographies. I find like the rise and fall of the civilizations, particularly the geology that we looked at, I felt strengthened it. I think there's just some good con convergences. Uh, but one of the questions I've had about, you know, reading the Book of Mormon is when it refers to like Lamanites and Nephites. I think you even had a passage on the screen, a scripture, and it sort of like listed, you know, the Lamanites consisted of like Ishmaelites or Lemuelites or um, I can't remember the other ites. Uh, but one question, you know, I've had or I know people have brought up to me is why is there not maybe clear mentioned in the Book of Mormon to like some of the other maybe local indigenous uh, groups or tribes or, you know, like the Mayans that are explicitly, uh, some people would read the Book of Mormon as if it's just like the descendants of Nephi or Laman and Lemuel. What's your well, thought? Because you were saying that you think the Gadianton robbers at the end of the Book of Mormon is a reference to the Teotihuacanos. Yeah, or, or, or they're people that have allegiance or, or locals that are in alliance with them, right? Right. You had, right. You had some Nephites were considered Gadiantans, but right. Um, so, um, well, you got to understand what does layman mean in Hebrew? It means unbeliever. So, oh, yeah. I, actually, I actually don't know if I, I don't think I knew you thought. Yeah. Matt Bowen uh, came up with that. And also in the characters document, the Lamanite glyph, um, the, the, it's a little crook neck means, unbeliever it also means dirty filthy um and in hebrew in, uh in egyptian or oh, egyptian oh yeah, that's in interesting yeah and then in tattoo con that same glyph has been interpreted as, as if you're not a mixed audience here meaning shit so huh. people talk about oh was there any race is there any it's like well yes of course there was prejudice the Nephites didn't like all these. They were fighting them all the time. Now, it doesn't mean the righteous Nephites. And you were, see some of those words in there describing them like savage, you know. Yeah, filthy, exactly. Dark. And right. you're saying that what the meaning doing. of Liam in, in Egyptian could mean that? Uh, in, Hebrew, in Hebrew, it means unbeliever and also yeah. in Egyptian. So when it says, oh, they didn't talk about the other groups. It's like they did. It was everybody else that wasn't either polity or, polity or didn't believe them. They just classified them as Lamanites. Now they... There's it's it's dichotomous, meaning, and I kind of show that in the characters document. There are different glyphs for Nephite. Sometimes it means like the Christian church, and we know that just from the text, because you have um when Alma went in to Amulek, he says, Oh, I'm a Nephite. I'm like, well, of course you live in a Nephite poly. No, he's saying he's a Christian, right? So so yeah. the, the term Nephite can mean different things. Because I think Jacob, I think it's Jacob who's basically says like all those who are like friendly or with Nephi, yeah. he calls Nephites. So it's m maybe not necessarily like blood descendant. And you're saying that for the Lamanites, it could be a reference to basically those who aren't Nephites, like the unbelievers, almost like Jew and Gentile. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's different uses because I mean, Mormon says these what a pure Lehite or whatever. So, so yeah. some, of, some of them did track lineage, I think, but, but yeah, it's not, and again, it's a simplified record. They're not caring about, I don't think they even knew what, what the heck was going on in T call. I mean, that's what I think what happened in the last battle. Mormon they didn't know they were, what was going on. You know, they just came with these massive amounts of people and overcame them. You know, mm. I do think he picked the location and things that he thought he could defeat them, but he, I mean, he knew kind of what was imminent, but, but yeah. And so it's, it's not like they were a somewhat smaller group. I mean, the characters document that 20,000, that little four with the, little six over it that you noticed that that means 20,000. Well, that's in the character's document. That says 20,000 went to Zarahemla, fled with Mosiah. So that's all there was, in, mm. you know, when they joined with the people of Mulek. So that they weren't this huge population. Um, and, and again, they left behind probably people that were Nephites, but they were no longer believing, right? Uh, I know, um, I can't remember which book is this, maybe in Mosiah, where... 
or I it could be in Jacob, but I know there's a part where it talks about like the Lamanites, like their population was so much larger than the Nephites, like rapidly bigger, which only seems like it could be possible if they were referring to sort of like other groups or them intermingling yeah. with other people there. Yeah, join other alliances, right? So. Right. That's interesting. Yeah. And I think as well, I can't remember the reference, so someone should fact check me on this. I should look this up beforehand, but I think there's a revelation where the Lord refers to like the Lamanites, those who are either Lamanites by like descent, descendants, or those who have dissented that he refers yeah. to as Lamanites, almost like it could be the literal descendants of Laman and Lamiel, but it could also be those who have dissented. Right. And and I think maybe we don't no we don't have the glyph form, so we don't know necessarily which one they're referring to all the time. Sometimes in context, you can tell. For that's example, really interesting that Laman means unbeliever in in Hebrew. That's yeah. that's interesting. Well, Le Lemuel's kind of interesting because that we have that in the Bible. It means king of Massa, Asa, but Massa upon it is contention. So he's the king of contention oh. <laughs> yeah, so yeah so i'm saying there's i think all the names have some meanings you know we don't necessarily get them all but right but, uh, and that's what i tried to do with the jaredites like I, I could find pretty much meaning for all the jaredite names from sumerian sumerian has a lot of homonyms and things so i'll, I'll have to do an episode with either yourself or definitely matt bowen and talk a little bit about the the names in the book more i think that'll actually be a fascinating episode yeah, matt Matt Bowen's probably the better one. I mean, that's what his master, that's what his doctor's the, I mean, that's all he does, you know, it's, and he's got you a lot of reach out to him. Yeah. But like the layman was interesting. Cause I, that was one I, when I did the book. I was like, I can't figure this out really well in Egyptian. I was like, I'm not, I know what it is from the context. I know um, like the dirty and filthy, but I didn't know the unbeliever connection in he Hebrew. And then once he published his, paper or at least i saw it maybe he posted it earlier that oh okay and i looked like well there it is right there and believe her in egyptian so so anyway um, that's interesting yeah, yeah that's a, fast ask you a couple of rapid fire questions just sure. the characters document so and no down a few so um so a, a critic or an unbeliever might say that okay you, you've compared like um you know lots of different characters in you know egyptian hieratic hieratic uh demotic comparing to some even mind glyphs uh for the numbers but they might say that um you know you're, you're trying to compare it to like you know hundreds or even you know thousands of characters to find sort of like a match but why not just say that the characters look closer to just deformed english and that you know you could you could find a match if you compare enough characters yeah well i think that that point has come up also with Tellurian, um, I think that Tellurian, I probably got that wrong, the shorthand, Tyrolean shorthand. Um, it's like, well, when you have so many hieratic characters, of course, some are going to look like um, uh, some of the alphabetical. I mean, there's only 26, so you got a 1,500 hieratic characters. Well, some are going to look the same or similar. So, mm. So it's not... It's really not a proper comparison to say it's deformed English. I mean that, but that's the key. Is if you can see my translation, it's using hieratic. It's not using deformed English. It's not using. It's just hieratic. So, I, like I say, I don't really care about all, all the other people are saying. The proof is if it translates correctly in a hieratic, it doesn't matter what you think it looks like. Mm. If the translation is correct, then it is hieratic, primarily with some demotic and Mesoamerican influences. So I, I'm just saying, if you think it's deformed English, we'll try translating it using that. It doesn't mean anything. But if you use hieratic, I mean, that's the key. It's like, you know, Dan Vogel published something, says, hey, I can find I can find English, I can find it in Roman, I can find it, you know. What he didn't do is look at hieratic, <laughs> interestingly enough. I think I Dan Vogel so tried to argue that uh, a lot of the characters come from perhaps like magical books or parchments. I remember watching his videos. Yeah, on... and, I'm just, and I'm just saying that we're told it's Reformed Egyptian. If I, and it's in Mesoamerica, and I translate it with hieratic Egyptian and some mnemonic, and it has a Mesoamerican structure to it and a few Mesoamerican glyphs with a few Sumerian ones, I think, from Jaredites thrown in. 
that's it. I'm just saying that's what you would expect it to be. I've given you a translation. It's all academic based. Egyptologists have looked at my stuff. They haven't. They basically said your use of the dictionaries and everything is correct, but they don't really, under, you know, they don't know about Mesoamerican date structures or they don't know what they are. And so there are some things that they couldn't really. And, and you know, honestly, even like the Sumerian book, I, the guy, the guy who reviewed it said, "Hey, what you, your methodological is correct. You're using the Sumerian correct. Everything is correct." He said, "But one thing." He says, if this is correct, it means the Book of Mormon is true, which it cannot be. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that's all I'm saying. Meaning, if you do, if you come from the premise, like Stan Vogel and those guys, I don't have any problem with their research, but they're coming from the premise <clears throat> that it's fake. And so I'm coming from the premise that, oh, if I can translate it in heretic Egyptian, maybe it's not fake. Maybe it is. Yeah. And it's reasonable and it matches the Book of Mormon exactly, chronologically, exactly. The names are in there exactly, and the meaning is exactly the names that you would expect in the Egyptian. Then there you go. So, and, and that's, that, that's why no one's really taken it on. I think. Well, my follow up question is: What has been the general response? Because you said like you you've had it, you know, peer reviewed. Um, what has been sort of like the general response from either non LDS scholars or uh, faithful? Uh, LDS scholars of this work translation on the characters document. Well, like I said, parts of it, you know, again, there were different, I did it in different sections, right? I didn't, I, I, and partly the peer review, I would send out a certain section. So there's different, but generally speaking, the Mayanists are all, all LDS that have looked at it and they found it very interesting. They think it maybe matches, you know, um, the again nobody's published anything which i'm happy to respond to something if somebody the egyptologists like i say they've looked at it i mean i haven't really had any non-lds because honestly i can't find any of them that care enough even if you pay them to review it and right. i think they all and the, and the problem is is if they found if it was correct then what does that mean right you know they're not gonna they're nobody's gonna come out and say it was, it was kind of like <laughs> In this but, last book, it was very to <laughs> the Church Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or Mormonism. Yeah, well, kind of funny because I did this um, book on the signs and wonders and Christ's birth, showing you know that I'm actually giving an explanation of a coronal mass emission that shifts the northern lights south over Mesoamerica that hit the Earth. That's been known. It was 1859. It happened, and it was also very bright and everything. So what? I, and so I sent it out to all these people in Academia.edu to look at. <laughs> One guy who's just a debunker of everything, not LDS. He goes, I'm so glad. He goes, you've shown, because that's his thing. Is he shows that all miracles are just natural. There really aren't miracles, you know? He goes, so you've actually debunked this whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, yeah, I go, the only problem is I'm debunking a text that was given to a guy by an angel. <laughs> <laughs> then he goes yeah. what <laughs> yeah and he goes well then forget all what the I tax, then. <laughs> yeah forget all of what i said and that's exactly what i'm talking about you can't they look at it they can look at it academically but in the that's what's different about book of Mormon studies that's how it never says oh you gotta have all this peer-reviewed it's like well i do have it peer-reviewed but the reality is you know they all know the end game here well yeah because if they authenticate your translation, then that in a way authenticates it's, the the Book of Mormon. Then. It's Charles Charles Anthon all over again. That's all I'm saying. It's the same thing. Is is they would have to if you believe you know he had there's different recounting, but the one was he was leaving and then he, he said, "Oh, this was a book brought by an angel. He took it, and ripped it up." You know his his approval yeah. of the translation or something. I mean, I, you know, there's different accounts Anthony didn't say that i think martin harris said that but but again that's the same principle is you're not anybody involved in book of mormon read and that's why most of the mayanists or your lds don't say anything about the book of mormon you know or any anybody that's you know and that they all gravitate towards well and that's why you have a bunch of lds people say it's a 19th century text and publishing because it's like well to say that that's easy you're you're avoiding all the hard things like you know, it is a historical text. What does that mean if it's a historical text? And so I think even to publish in their different genres, they can't say anything other than that. Right. Or, or no one will publish. They have any sort of like scholarly credibility amongst like their academic yeah. peers. Yeah, right. So. 
Okay, uh, so I can understand. So no non-LDS scholars have looked at it to either verify or agree or to like, Part, like parts, of it, it. parts of it, just parts of it, parts of it. But uh, the total yeah. book, your translation, it's not no. gotten much attention. I'm with well, I, scholars. And the, reality, and the reality is, see, books. I haven't peer reviewed. I I pay for all my books to be peer reviewed. Most mm -hmm. books aren't, unless they're like an academic publishing house. Most people publish books and then they get book reviews. That's the form of peer review for books. And mine is out on the internet, right? For free. So you don't even have to buy it. So I, I welcome anyone to do a book review on it. The geology book got a book review, but again, it was by an LDS person. Right. You know? So, so, I mean, I'm just saying there's been plenty of comments on it and, and people uh, say, People say I'm not convinced. I'm like, well, what isn't convincing? You know, I mean, I, I, I'm just waiting for someone, and I'm not saying I'm 100 correct in every jot and tittle, but I think I, substantially I, it's correct. And do you sort of feel like you want other scholars to sort of like weigh in and see if they corroborate it and come to like similar I, conclusions or like, similar findings with the translation or like, it's like all my it's all my other like all my other publications? I don't really care. <laughs> so right. I just put it out there. It's. You know that's great if they do, but um, you know, and, you know, some of my publications they've liked, you know, geology and like the Order of Nehor is actually an important work, and I think some people lifted from it actually and published parts of it, and they got all these accolades and like, well, was <laughs> but I don't care. It just explains, you know, the Book of Nehor or the Order of Nehor in Mesoamerica and kind of shows how it matches the my religion. So I, I guess what I'm saying is. It'd be nice if somebody engaged with it, but I'm not holding my breath. I don't really care. I'm just working on my next book. You know, I just, right. I've got, I've got another one I'm working with Don Bradley on. So, oh, wow. Well. Just the Fred G. Williams characters, I think. And then I've, I've got another one basically on the, the Arabian Peninsula path. Um, maybe some information that might be interesting. Okay. Um, um, final question. What if someone were to say, well, Jerry, you're not a trained like linguistic scholar or expert, and until non LDS scholars verify it, like you're you have motivated reasoning as a believer, and you know how can we trust your translation? You're just trying to you know authenticate the Book of Mormon. Well, I mean, the first thing it's like, how do you authenticate a Spanish translation? Any, let's say you, let's say you got a Spanish translation from Google Translate. I don't know anything from anywhere. What do you do with it? Mm -hmm. You compare it. You compare it with the dictionaries, right? Yeah, that's all. I'm saying I don't. It doesn't. This isn't. This isn't really me. I mean, the translation kind of speaks for itself. You can look up the meaning. You can look up the, the glyph and the form and all of that. So. I, I have translated for all my life. Well, since I was, you know, in my twenties, I worked as a as a freelance translator. Not not Egyptian, but it, the concepts are not uh, not different, really. You're still just looking for glyphs and the meaning of the glyph. Find it. Um, so, 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 so I mean, do you I'm, think I'm saying if they if they, don't, if they don't want to believe it, I don't really, I don't. Like I said in another talk, I said it's free. If you don't like it, just delete it. <laughs> I don't really, I don't care. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to convince anybody of, to join the church or believe in the Book of Mormon. It's just, I'm just fascinated by the Book of Mormon. I do research related to the Book of Mormon and people can make with it what they will, but it is, all my publication is academic grade, research cited. So anybody, you know, can see what I'm talking about on any of my books. I just don't understand why not more of like, like we have like Egyptologists or like Mesoamerican scholars, you know, in the church. I'm, I just don't understand why they're not giving it more attention or writing. Well, art it's, or... It's, con it's controversial. I think part of yeah. it was, I think nobody attempted anything because it got burned by the book of Abraham. So, you know, hey, we come out and oh, these papyri don't say, you know, the facsimiles don't say what, that's not Egyptian. Right. And by the way, I'm going to work with Royal Scousen on getting an original text of the book of Abraham. That's something we need, but oh, cool. But, 
yeah but so i think maybe just people were i, I mean i don't know i I, really, <laughs> I don't know i just came in and says oh it's interesting i can see all these numbers and i mean I, what do i know i'm just a guy that i was fascinated with ancient number systems and how they worked how they're put together so yeah. i suppose maybe i came with a different approach and honestly the guy that translated the dresden codex or figured it out was a chemical engineer he wasn't a bionist so not not everything is done by linguists. In fact, sometimes linguists, I think on this case, you have to kind of look beyond your, your so, linguist soda straw and say, okay, I've got to account for some variability perhaps or some substitution or you have to understand where it was at. That's the other problem. Well, people think it's in the heartland. Well, you're not going to find any of these Mesoamerican connections if that's where you're thinking. You're not going to look at the Mesoamerican date structure, right? So... I don't know, like a lot of people maybe believed it was there and want to find it in Micmac or something, which it isn't there. But so I, I all I know is I just looked at it. I says, oh, I can make sense of it. I started translating it. It's like, oh, actually, I'm finding pretty much everything in either heretic or demonic. And so, and huh. like, like you've seen, it's, I, it's very thoroughly documented and, um, I use linguistic principles too. So I'm not just, you know, I just didn't have a revelation one day and write down something, you know, right. like, you, know you know what I'm saying? That's it's, and I don't know. It's, it's, I think it's just been this mystery for all these years. And so everybody assumes that somebody looked at it or I just don't think anyone really looked at it very close. That's, that's do, do you know what I think would be really interesting is if you like presented your work to a non LDS scholar but you did not uh, tell them what the origin is of the characters document, but just presented it to them. Look at these characters, look at your work. What do you think of his translation without telling them about the implication to the book more and then see what the reaction would be. That that would be interesting. But I think because of the origin, yeah, a lot no of people just wouldn't want to weigh in or consider right. it. But, that, but that's the thing. The best I can get is, yes, you have used, you're using... These are hieratic. I mean, that's kind of funny. I had some some people who weren't believing, were arguing. Well, that's not that hieratic. It should be another form. Maybe it's this cliff form. I'm like, okay, now we're talking about it is hieratic, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. so, so you guys are admitting that there is Egyptian here. And so the, the debate is not whether there is an Egyptian in the characters document. It's what form maybe you're looking at. So looking at. So hmm. I'll, I'll, I can just tell you that the I, I don't I can't I don't really know why it hasn't been engaged with. And again, I've gone on to other research. I did update it because I figured out a few things during my other research. And even this, even this last book I did with the signs and wonders, the glyph form that I had for brightness, you know, the night of brightness actually has the form of the of the northern lights, like squiggly snakes, two squiggly snakes in Egyptian. So I think it actually that, that translation I need to expand it. <laughs> and I don't know. So so well, I, I think I think your research is fascinating. I think more people need to be talking about it. Hopefully, um, this this episode, this interview will promote it a bit more and get more people maybe to engage in it because I I think it's I think it's fascinating, and 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 we're probably gonna do another episode as well, kind of looking at the the rest of the translation, but that will be done another time. Um, but that'll yeah. be good. And I also think we should do an episode about the gold plates. I did a recent interview with Neil Rapley, and he's done a lot of recent research comparing, you know, the the gold plates to you know other uh, ancient metal records in the ancient world. And we talk a little bit about the dimensions of the plates, and he used some of uh, your work. But I'd love to talk a little bit about like size, dimension of the plates. Could the text of the Book of Mormon, you know, fit fit on the plates, and maybe res responding to some of the critical attacks on the gold plates. So that can maybe be another episode down the road. Yeah, and I actually I actually worked on that, but I didn't I didn't publish it because actually I was doing that as part of the Ziff book, but then I ran I, I was able to translate the characters document, so I know exactly the I know exactly the density of words on the plates. <laughs> so I, I was like, why am I going to India or whatever? I actually have a translation of a text right from the plates and dimension, so I could just use that to project. So. I actually have that in one of my books where I project where I actually have a word count. So, I mean, I'm just saying, I don't, again, cause I'm not trying to answer all the critics. Right. I don't care. Right. Right. 
I just do the research. And uh, then that's my I job. Just no, just <laughs> yeah, yeah I don't, like I said, I'm not, I don't care. I mean, it's fine. I, I've, you know, I studied, I mean, I went to, you know, theology school in the Vatican. I worked in the Vatican as an intern. So, I mean, I have, I have all kinds of friends and people that are in other religions and, you know, lived in China. And so I don't have, but I don't have any desire to like engage in some fixed battle with people that don't. Yeah, no. They don't, I, you're not going to uh, convince them anyways. I mean, I, I was in politics for 12 years. I don't know if you knew that. I was county commissioner. Oh, no, so. I didn't know. Yeah. And so I, <laughs> I can tell you, once people get locked in a position, it doesn't matter what facts you've got. Right. <laughs> they will defend uh, it's it. It's important that end. it can come across that way because you don't want it to come across like it's sort of like this back and forth between like uh, an apologist or a critic. But I personally, by like my approach is if, if say, a critic has, um, say, a strong argument or a criticism, you know, going against uh, a truth claim or let's say the goal plates. I sort of want to hear and almost present the the response and, and the faithful scholarship on it and almost bring that to light for some people who may feel that um, they don't have an answer to that. And that's why I think that can be quite helpful. Is, yeah, well, don't get me, is, don't get me, don't get me wrong. I, I put the, you know, my books in ex Mormon Reddit, you know, the link and give me comments, you know, I don't care. Oh, you know, you're I'm going through, it's part of my peer review. I get them and, <laughs> whoever I can send it to. I send it out to a thousand academics on academic.edu. And yeah, I mean, you know, I have to pick through the F words sometimes. I, I would love to have read through amazing. the comments of the responses to your translation. <laughs> well, well, they just most of them got angry. They go, who is this guy spamming in here, putting his link everywhere? Get rid of him. You know, like they weren't <laughs> interested in reading it and I don't care. So, yeah, but I'm saying if you have substantive comments, I'm all for it. You know, I don't, but I'm not like, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to convince anybody. It's just, again, I want, I want people to criticize or, you know, look at my work. And I have some people out there. There's some guys that are, that are looking in a demotic and say, Hey, I think I found something. And then I'll go back and say, I don't think that, or one thing, ah, that's actually good. I think maybe you had a better example of that. There's also a lady that attempted a translation from demotic. She worked on it for years of the RLDS church and she found some of the same stuff, not completely. So I, I mean, what I'm saying is I don't, I don't act like I have like a um, a license on truth or anything. And I yeah, you almost want other people to join in and almost try to critique and examine. Your, yeah, your like when I was in politics, I I encourage other people to run against me, right? Because I didn't think it was healthy that I just run and get elected just as an incumbent. And yeah, you know, another party always said they always liked me because I always helped them out in their campaigns, told them what to do. You know. <laughs> And, and that's why I don't, I I don't really care. Like, I'm just like, elect the best person. If it's not me, it's not me. <laughs> why, why yeah. Care? That's why I sort of like the the back and forth. I, I don't like it to be too combative, but sometimes I feel, particularly on like, say, YouTube or podcasts, uh, critics tend to dominate the space a lot and, you know, attack. Yeah, they, 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 they follow yeah, church they and truth it. claims. And sometimes I feel like uh, we need to bring to light more sort of like, the scholarship and the faithful responses to things to make it more accessible for people. Cause up until nine months ago, I'd never heard of your, your translation, your work. Yeah. Well, like the, whatever those, the ward radio guys just called me, you know, cause they actually ran across Brad. What's his name? I can't. I brought it back. Yeah. I think they, they've done a yeah, recent. So they, want me, they, want me on, they want me on in a couple of weeks to talk about this, you know, because yeah, we just ran across it, and I'm like, well, it's been out eight years, so yeah, it's been free on the internet. And if you did a search on characters, and mine, mine comes up like top of Google, so it's, it's not, nobody's been looking it up. <laughs> I, I know, I don't. Again, I don't know. People just promote what they want to promote. And podcasters, I think it's because it's not actually not one of the most common criticisms by critics either. It's like obviously, I've, I've come across the criticisms level against the characters document, like oh, deformed it. English, but other than maybe Dan Vogel's videos or like maybe something a Mormon think, uh, I I hadn't come across it that frequently. That that yeah, right. maybe people aren't uh, looking into it that much. Yeah, and like I say, it's not it's not sexy, right? I mean, bring Don Bradley on to talk about polygamy, and everybody's you know it's more interesting. Twenty twenty thousand views or whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My no, stuff and is this is it was quite technical it was definitely going into the weeds it was more academic i know for me i probably would have to go back re-watch this and yeah. really 
pausing I intend, through the book. I intend, in the, I intend in the future, once I'm done with the projects I want to do, is go back because I have the finances. I, that's why I don't sell books. I can pray for printing. I just I'll go back and probably do some videos, series of videos that are a little more explanatory and simpler language as to what how the translation. Yeah. Occurred. And, and spend more in depth for anybody that is caring to like follow it. Um, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll probably do that. But I, like I say, I have a bunch of books. So I, I'm trying to do that with all the books. Yeah. Oh, well, I'll, I'll put the link in where people can find and read your books and we'll schedule a time to do the next part on the trans, uh, the characters documents. Um, but I think this has been a really fascinating episode and thanks so much for coming on. Yeah. Awesome. And listeners who've been watching, if you've enjoyed this, uh, give it a like, uh, comment underneath your thoughts as well. Go check out Jerry's books and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any future interviews and episodes that I'll be doing. Uh, I'll see you next time on More This with Murph. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone for watching this episode. If you've enjoyed it, please give it a like, share it with others who might benefit and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future content. You can also listen to these episodes on podcast form on Anchor or Spotify and you can follow me on Facebook, Instagram and TikTok. Check out my website for more content, personal blog and more. And if you care to donate to support me, you can buy my PayPal or Patreon or through the website and you can also give donations via YouTube through Super Chats. Thanks for watching Mornism with the Murph. Take care. Bye-bye.